בעזרת השם, ברפואה והצלחה, וזיווג איתי בנסדם, ועילוי נשמת יוסף בן מרים, להצלחת אדוארדו בן ביאטרי, שיחזור בתשובה. If you take the amount of suffering Ruben had, put it on a scale, 80 kilo. If you take the amount of suffering of uh, Shimon, 50 kilo. So who suffered more? Ruben, not necessarily. Absolutely not. Maybe Shimon is much more spoiled. He's what we call a stenis. He suffered a lot more. He kicked him out of his house, he didn't have a place to shower, he's used to shower twice in August, twice a day, suffering, sticky and smelly, and he's going crazy all day. The other one is Mr. Stinky. Likes to be, you know, doesn't care anyway, doesn't take showers. He doesn't suffer if he was kicked out of his home. Ah, big deal, three days, he's managing. So you see that it's all relative. Depend on the person. Some people lose money, they go crazy. They're broken. They depress. Some people a minute later forget about it. Stuck rush. Every day is like this now. Every day the market goes down. Open up the computer, 10,000 loss. Next day, open the computer, 20,000 loss. Next day, open the computer, 40,000 loss. Imagine the life like this. Already for a few months, not Shemitah. Every year of Shemitah, it's a disaster. Some people already killed themselves. They're no longer here. And some people move on with their life. Run to war, business as usual. You just lost 20,000 now. Why am I, I going to sit on the floor and cry? So the suffering is relative, meaning you can't compare the suffering of one individual to the suffering of the other one. There are guys who in yeshiva, dying to get married, every hour, that's all they talk about. Rabbi, I have to find me someone, I'm dying here, you have to find me. There are guys who say, no, no, I'm not in a rush, I want to learn. You're not suffering without a woman? Yeah, it bothers me, but at least I learn. I'm focusing on my learning. This guy suffer a hundred times more than this guy. Same thing by the girls. One is more depressed about it, one is not. Everyone with these preferences in life. Therefore, there is no, no point of comparing the suffering of one to the suffering of the other. There's a famous story of the Rebbe from uh, Nikasberg, Tzanz Hasidim in, New, in Union, New Jersey. The whole Hasidut is thanks to him, he survived the Holocaust. And he came to America on the boat. There were 400 young boys, guys, they're survivors. All of them look like skeletons. And of course, they only had one shirt, very dirty, one pants, maybe jacket, and nothing else. They're coming to America hoping to find better life after the horror they went through. 
So the Rebbe said, I have another extra pair of tzitzit with me. I have one on me. I have one extra one. There's no privilege now to have two when no one here has. So I would like to make a lottery. Everyone will get a number, we'll put it in a basket, and we'll pick up a number, and whoever's, whoever's going to win that tzitzit, I'm going to give it to him as a gift. At least one more Jew will have the merit to have a tzitzit, which is every second a mitzvah. One wise guy immediately heard that. He took his dress shirt, ripped it from the left, ripped it from the right, cut it open all the way up to the underarm, and say to him, now I have an obligation to put tzitzit. They don't have an obligation, because they don't have a a garment that has four corners. You only need tzitzit if you wear something that has four corners. <coughs> Since none of them has it, they are not going to be punished from the Torah for not wearing tzitzit. They lose the reward maybe, but there's no punishment for not having it. I, however, must have tzitzit now. If not, I'm violating the rules of the Torah. So you, are, you have to give me the tzitzit. Wise guy. The Rebbe told him, very nice, but there's only one problem. The Torah said, what came out of your mouth, you must keep. And I already said that I'm going to make a lottery, and whoever's going to win will get it. But I'm certain that if you so much for the sake of heaven, that the only shirt you have in life, you are willing to rip it in order for you to get a tzitzit from me, that your number is going to come up from the 400 guys here. I don't have to tell you which number came up. His number. His number. That Rebbe lost, what, 10 or 11 of his kids? 11. 11 of his kids. Kloisenberg. He lost, in the Holocaust, the Nazis murder 11 of his children. 11. All of them, right? All of them. When he remarried. His oh, wife. wait. His wife also? Yeah. His he wife remarried. and all his children. His wife and 11 children. Can you believe that tragedy for a person? It's unbelievable how you ever continue to live another hour after something like that. So when he arrived to Union, New Jersey, after all he's been for, he started again the Hasidut right here in America. First he was in Williamsburg. He first was in New Orleans moved, then he moved to Union, New Jersey, and then one man came to him to cry to him for losing his son in the Holocaust. I had one son and the Nazis murdered him. I had one son and the Nazis murdered him. <coughs> and he started to cry and the Rebbe is crying with him. They sit and cry and cry and cry. After crying so much, that person said to the Rebbe, wait a minute, why are we crying over one, one son of mine when, we, when you lost 11? We should cry for you, not for me. Your suffering is uh, 11 times worse than mine. That's when the Rebbe told him, God forbid, I don't have any suffering. Hashem gave and Hashem took and it's absolutely fine by me. And he said to him, wait a minute, if that's the case, it's hypocrisy. You cry with me over my son. It's not even your son. Look at you, you're all broken. And now I suggest that we should cry for you 11 children. <coughs> and you told me, no, no, everything is perfect. What's going on here? And he answered him a beautiful answer. This is a message for life. He said to him, when people come to me to cry about their problems, I enter their head and I feel their pain while they're sitting here. Meaning like, it's like a download. I download your pain and I feel it with you. When I have the same issue, it doesn't bother me. I'm crying for your pain, not for what really happened to you for the way you take it. You're not in a high level to accept that Hashem gave you and Hashem took it. 
You're not in that level. Because of that, you suffer every day. When you come to cry to me, I feel so bad for you. I cry with you for your pain. But I don't cry about my 11 children. Why? They're 11. Why should I cry? If you send your kid to yeshiva in Jerusalem, the best yeshiva in the world, you sit in America and cry, no? And you miss them, yes. You sometimes want to be with them, yes. But you know they're in a good place. So if they tell you, no, I want to come back and walk around in the street of Brooklyn and play basketball with the... Uh, with the gangs over there. What would you say in that case? No, no, stay over there. Stay in Yeshiva while you're out of your mind. Why? You don't want to see me? You don't love me? You don't miss me? No, you don't. Because I love you and because I miss you and because I care about you, I want you to stay there. That's the same thing. A good parent, if his child died, he wants him to be in heaven. So why is he crying? Not for the child. For himself. Every parent who cries for losing a child, especially younger than Bar Mitzvah, before he committed sins, he only cries for himself. Because knowledge, knowing the kid is in heaven, why would you cry over it? That's the goal, no? Your kid finally made it. They don't have to be reincarnated again. They died before Bar Mitzvah. they crystal pure. So why are you crying? You're crying for yourself. That's what it's all about. Missing someone, believe it or not, it's selfishness. We cry over our pain. And that's what's going on here. So, we have to be grateful to Hashem. One of the most important things in life is gratefulness. You're not allowed to help someone that is ungrateful. Helping someone that is ungrateful is Do not set a trap in front of a blind person. What's the connection? If someone is a thief, you don't leave him in a room with cash on a, on a table. Right? It's not fair. Why are you putting it in such a position? Someone is a recovering drug addict. You don't put cocaine on a table and leave. He may overcome the test, but there's always a chance that, so you know what, I gotta have it. Someone that is, cannot control his appetite. You don't bring him to a non-kosher place with delicious food. He's not gonna be able to hold the, the test. Someone that cannot be grateful. His nature is to be ungrateful. The more favors you do to him, the more punishments he will get for not being grateful. Better not to help him. If you actually love him, your brother, don't help him. He never say thank you. And on the opposite, he, com he complain. Why it's only this? Someone came through the door yesterday. A woman, a faker. You can see right away she's a faker, but you want to still give them five dollars, even though you know they're faker. My problem is much bigger than this. They already dictate to you. That's what I can give you right now. Do you want it? No. You have to do better. Negotiation. <laughs> the poor people of today, they, they negotiate. What happened to the shame that people come and they ask for donation and they put their head down like the Gemara say? Apparently there's no more shame. No more shame. That's what brought the world to such a disaster situation. Uh, everybody lost their shame. In the old days, people had shame. Shame was a, a major guard. It's guarding you from doing horrible things. People would be embarrassed to dress in a certain way. People would be embarrassed to talk in a certain way. It's all gone. No more shame. Because there's no more shame, it shows that people lost their wisdom. There's no more wisdom. Because shame and wisdom is one thing. When Adam and Eve, before they ate from the tree of knowledge, tree of wisdom, they were walking naked like monkeys. Monkeys walk naked in a safari. Everybody take pictures of them. They don't understand that something here is wrong. They are monkeys. They are programmed not to be ashamed 
because they don't have a neshama, they don't have a soul, they don't have spirituality. Shame comes only from someone that has a soul, not from a piece of meat. A piece of meat doesn't have shame. So the monkeys don't understand, they are monkeys. After Adam and Eve ate from the tree, first reaction was shame. Immediately they made themselves something to cover themselves. So what do you see? As soon as the wisdom entered the brain, first reaction is, oh my gosh, what are we doing? Let's go and make some clothes. Immediately they made themselves something to wear. So when you see that 90% of the people in the world walk naked in the street, you understand that these people have no wisdom, nothing, zero. Their, their brain is empty. Because someone with class, regardless of religion, will never dare to dress like an animal, meaning not dress. I always like to give an example of Queen Elizabeth. One thing I know about her, I don't know anything about her, besides that she was some kind of a billionaire with a great collection of rubies and diamonds. And for some reason the British are all admiring her to a level that I never seen before. But one thing I can say for her is that she was always dressed classy and modest. I don't remember ever seeing her in any time you ever saw her dress horrible like the way the women dress today on the street. Why is it? Was she a rabbit's end? Maybe she was born in Mea Sharim and we never know about it. Maybe it was Hasidish, no? Huh? No. She was a Goya. I don't even think she was religious. But one thing she did know, I'm a queen. I'm from a royal family. I'm not a monkey. When I will act as a monkey, that means I don't deserve to be a queen. You cannot be both. You have to decide you are a human being or you are an animal. If you decide to be an animal, then you attack, then you murder, then you walk naked, then you steal, then you do all these things. There's only one animal that King Solomon says you should go and learn from it how to behave. Huh? Ants. Ants. The ants. The ants live six months, and they need one and a half seed of rice or wheat. Take one rice, put it on the table, take another one, cut it in half. Good luck with that. And that's the amount of food that the ant needs in their entire six months of life. But when you come to see the stash that the ant prepared over the six months, sometimes it can be the size of this room. No joke. You can feed hundreds of people from the amount of seeds that the ant collected in six months. The entire life of the ant is collecting and hiding, collecting and hiding. But the end has a rule. If somebody grabbed a piece of rice or wheat and it fell on the way, meaning it got tired, a different end come to take it, it smells it. Ah, it was in a position of a different end. I cannot touch it. It's gazelle. It's stealing. It's not mine. What's not mine is not mine. That's very interesting. The entire thing that the ants have, it's all stolen. Who did they get it from? They steal from us. So meaning they're very faithful to each other. <laughs> to each other. It reminds me, when we, when we were kids, there was always Lagba Omer. You know Lagba Omer? You need a lot of pieces of wood. Where will you get? Israel doesn't have Home Depot like here. You can't, you put it on the car, fill up your big minivan. It's a different lifestyle back then. Who had a car to fly? So all the kids now are hunting to find pieces of wood. Where? Construction. Construction buildings. Wow, imagine how happy we were that they're building a building in the area. A massive commando attack to clean up all the pieces of wood from that construction site. And everyone made a pile somewhere. And we had a gentleman agreement, kids, five years old, six years old, seven years old, a gentleman agreement. Nobody steal from each other's pile. All of us are thieves. 
we steal from the contractor, but nobody steal from each other. Very similar to the end. So are we are, are we righteous or wicked? According to King Solomon, there's a lot to learn from the end. How can it be? What's to learn from the end? Hazal telling us the answer. Hazal are saying that the end saved so many pieces of wheat, maybe Hashem will extend my life. <laughs> it has faith. As long as I'm alive, there's always a chance that Hashem will add some years to my life. That's why they work non-stop. That's what King Solomon said, Lech Nemala Atzel. What does it mean, Atzel, with I? Lazy. Okay, go to the end, you lazy bum, and learn how to behave. Why? Non-stop walking. Non-stop walking. The mice. The Gemara speaks about the mice. The mice, the Gemara says, Achbarim rish einimu. In Aramic, in Hebrew, it means, in English, it means, the mice are wicked. Why they are wicked? Because if they discover a piece of dough, like see your wife making dough for Shabbos, to prepare good halot. Imagine if a mouse finds out no one is in the kitchen right now, and there's a way to go and start eating. He's not attacking the dough by himself. Immediately he called the entire gang. In less than a minute, you have 30, 30 of them calling all over the door. What happened, by the way, if you caught the mouse right on time, before he called all his gang, he took one bite from the door, and you came with a broom, boom, hit him, knocked him out. What's going to happen to the door now? You have five pounds of dough. Will you bake it for Shabbos or no? Huh? There are three kinds of people. There are people, big deal. So he took a little bite. But smart, I'm going to waste now five challahs. It's ten dollars in a bakery each. I'm not going to spend fifty bucks to go buy challahs. I have the dough ready. As it is, he makes it. There's another kind. They cut the piece where he, where he buy a bit from. <laughs> Take a knife, cut like a quarter pound, get rid of it. The rest is pure. He didn't touch it. <laughs> there is a third kind. He can't even touch the dog. Why a mouse was over it? And so he can look at it. One thing you should know, that if you eat from a dog that the mice, the, the mouse beat from it, it calls forgetfulness. Shichecha. It makes you forget. It makes you forget. It's some mystical reason. I, I can't really tell you the answer. It's one of those things that it's a secret. But that's what Igmara say. It calls you forgetfulness. Maybe that's why all of us don't remember anything. The bakeries are full of them. So every challah you buy, it's, and maybe it's about time to start making your own dough. Because most likely in the bakeries there are hands of mice. Hands. And make no mistake. So therefore, every time you buy challahs for Shabbos, don't be surprised why everything you learn on Shabbos and you come watch Shabbos, Shabbos to write it in your notebook, you don't remember 2%. What happened to everything I learned today? I want to conclude. Okay, Mahala from the bakery, There is another uh, scenario. What happened if a fly fell into your tea? On Not on Shabbos. On a regular day. A fly fell into your tea. You have nice Persian tea. It smells very good. There are three ways to handle it. One, get rid of the entire glass. Two, you take the... <laughs> Uh, fly out and you drink. And three, you take the fly out. You ready? 
squeeze it into your mouth not to lose two drops. <laughs> and there is a fourth kind. If you're Chinese, you eat the fly and you get rid of the teeth. <laughs> Flies and worms. Top. Everyone with their preferences. So I ask, I don't understand why the Chachamim call the mice wicked. If one of us, we, the, the chosen people, walk in a desert, in a, not in a desert, in a forest, millions of trees, and then we see by one of the trees something shiny is popping out from the leaves. We move some sand and leaves and we found a treasure from the time of the Turks. 300 years old. Open the box, gold coin, rubies, diamonds, 10 million dollar value. What would we do? Would we make sure to bury it very deep and make 500 marks that no one will ever find it, that every time we need some cash, we're gonna come, collect a diamond or two, go sell it, you know, for the rest of our life? Or we're gonna call everyone, Moshe, Yitzchak, guess what happened? I found a treasure, come, sh share it with me. Do you know anyone who will call his friends to come collect? <laughs> he would make sure none of them would ever find out. Where were you? No, I went to visit my grandma. In a forest? Yeah, she took a trip today. <laughs> so if the mouse is calling all his friends to come share the treasure with him, it's a tzaddik. Baal chesed, no? Or perhaps a fool. But why wicked? Huh? because it steals from the person. Oh, well, who gave you permission to eat? But he doesn't understand that. If the mouse is a thief, then the ant is also a thief. Why not? What's the difference? The rice is falling on the floor. Ah. The rice or the wheat that the ants find, it's what fell anyway. You just collect what fell. But you want to tell me now if, you, if you're going to have a bag of, of wheat or a bag of barley or a bag of rice and the ants will find that bag, they won't touch. They will only take it if it's loose on the floor. You're done with the calf school. Very, very nice. Top. Midei kashia lo yatsanu. We remain in a kashia. We remain in a, in a question. If you can give me an answer, why by the mice they are wicked? I can give you one idea. The mouse doesn't deserve so much credit as it sounds. Why? Because anyway he won't be able to finish three or five pounds of dough. How much he can eat? Anyway soon it's gonna be gone. He understand, no matter how much I eat and no matter how much I stuff my stomach, I won't touch 1% of the dough. So why not sharing it with a friend? Anyway, it will be gone. But if this dough will remain there forever, maybe he would not call his friends. He would keep it for himself. You know how the animals, when they find something, they go and hide it for later? They open a saving account. Especially <laughs> now with CD, you can get 4%. They prepare the pension plan for the future. So anyway, speaking about gratefulness, this is one of the most important things in life. If you're not a grateful person, you are not a kosher Jew. Why? Being a, a kosher Jew, rule number one, it must be grateful. Why is it? Because in the entire Judaism is a school to educate the person to be grateful. That's why everything in the Torah is permission, thank you, permission, thank you, permission, you eat, bracha, permission. Right <coughs> when you finish, Another bracha to say thank you. All the blessing, all the praises of Hashem, all the davening, it's all about thank you, thank you, thank you. The word Yehudi, the word Yehudi, if, you want, if somebody ever asks you, can you, the 
define Judaism in one word? One word. The answer is yes. One word defines the entire Judaism. Four letters. Mode. Mem, Vav, Dalet, Dei. Mode. What does it mean, Mode? Two meanings for one word, one word, one spelling, two different meanings. Mode means to admit. I always admit what's right and what's wrong without politics. That's the truth, I admit. It's not the truth, I deny. It doesn't matter what's in it for me, what will I lose, what will I gain, what shame will I get, what honor will I get, put it aside. First, true or false? Always stick to the truth. That's rule number one, mode. לעולם יהיה אדם ירא שמיים בסתר כבגלוי, הוא מודה על האמת ודובר אמת בלבבו. Person should always be a person that sticks to the truth, admits on the truth, and speaks the truth not only in his lips, with his lips, with his heart. Even when people cannot know what you're thinking, you adjust your mind always to stick and admire the truth. Even in your mind, which is a, even a higher level, sometimes in your mind you have a lot of corrupted things, but in the end you're afraid, so you just admit. You're afraid to be caught, you're afraid maybe there's a camera, you're afraid that, uh, you know, someone will come and testify that you are lying. There are always other things that you're afraid. So the fact that you say the truth doesn't really mean you're an honest person. But if you think always the truth, then you'll know for sure you're honest. Because what you're thinking, there's no God. So if you adjust your mind to always, no matter what, I'm with the truth, it doesn't matter what's going to happen to me. I don't move from the truth. That's a very high level. And that's, by the way, the requirement of a Jew, to stick to the truth even in his mind. Top. And what's the second mode? Mode minashon, thank you. Ani mode lecha. I thank you. Ani mode lach. I thank you to a female. Look, lecha, lecha, lach, lachem. Plural. Mode always remain the same. One is admitting, second is thanking. That's what Judaism is all about. Check. Every mitzvah is admitting and thanking. Admitting and thanking. That's it. So if you are a crook and ungrateful, what is Jewish about you? Nothing. Just the fact that you do a few things as a robot, that's not a Jew. It's a robot. A real kosher Jew never say a lie, never think about lies, never think about cheating and, and deceiving and who knows all these things that people do. And always extremely grateful, extremely for every little thing. Come on, you exaggerate. So what's the big deal? What he have done for you that you make such a big deal out of it? Oh, oh, oh. they say Rav Shach for 80 years used to go every year to a cemetery in Israel, far away from Nebra, more than an hour right. Every year he will read Tehillim by a grave of a woman. One time it was so rainy, pouring rain. The umbrella is flying, wind. He's all soaking wet. His assistant asked him, why you keep coming here? Who is this person? So one time I didn't have a shirt. And she came and gave me a shirt. That helped me so much when I was a teenager in yeshiva. Eight years later, I come every year to a grave to read the healing. For a shirt she gave him eight years ago. Why? It was such a big thing for him at that time. Kids appreciate if they get a shirt. You buy your kids five shirts. Amazon. Birkat Amazon. <laughs> five shirts arrive. If they are grateful, if you're very lucky and your kids are somewhat grateful, it's usually for 30 seconds. Right? 31 seconds after, they don't even remember, they just got no shirt. Another minute, they already complain, it's not good quality. <laughs> Another minute, you're such a terrible parent. You know I don't like this kind of company. Can fool them, twist the, 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 the brand, the tags. <laughs> and 
and find out that they're full of baloney. You know the famous story, the king is naked. You know that story? Yeah. Or not? <laughs> All the tailors came to prepare a special outfit for the king. One crook came. He said, I have a special outfit, your majesty, but only smart people can see it. Dumb people cannot see it. It's invisible for dumb people. Would you, would you like to wear such a thing? I don't know what kind of a fool would it be. If there was such a thing, don't you know that 90% of the people in the world have no brain? So everyone will look at you with no clothes. Why would you try such an outfit? Duh. Anyway, so now everyone is cheering because everyone trying to pretend they're smart. Wow, how would you like my outfit? Amazing! Who is that amazing tailor? The one little kid. Kids don't know politics. Mommy, why the king is naked? <laughs> Everybody, shh, silent. The king is naked. He's right. The king is naked. The king is <laughs> The tailor that a minute ago was about to win the Nobel Prize, you know, winning, was hung a minute later. Benji, you put the heat already. I want to remind you, September. <laughs> what with the heat? <sighs> aye, aye, aye. Anyway, I put the I want to read to you a story. Listen to this. This story relates to what we read on Shabbat in Parashat Kitavo. Parashat Kitavo, that famous parashat that has 98 curses, that people cannot even hear it, forget about experience those curses. In Shabbat, usually on Shabbat, by the Sparadim, everybody fight and compete who's going to buy the sixth aliyah the most important aliyah, sixth one. Based on Kabbalah, it's Tikkun HaYesod, Yosef HaTzadik. By the Ashkenazim, the third aliyah is the most important, after Kohen and Levi. If there's no Kohen and Levi, everyone agree, Kohen is the most important aliyah, the first one. But usually there is a Kohen, and then there is a Levi. And even if there's no Levi, the first Kohen is going for the second aliyah as well. So the first two aliyot is not open for selling. From the third one, everybody can buy it. So the third one by the Ashkenazim, usually they give it to the rabbis. Why? It's the first available aliyah for someone that is not a coin. Top. Svaradim, they go by Kabbalah. So the sixth one is the highest. Usually it sells for the most expensive one unless you are in a shul of ignorant people. Sometimes it happens to me that I go to places and people, I'm here at so they don't know. For Aliyat Revi, they're going to spend $500. Aliyat Shishi, $101. So it's like you have a silver coin and a gold coin. For the silver coin, they, uh, they offer $500. For the gold coin, $300. Then you understand that that person doesn't understand anything about coins. Sometimes you have people like this in a shul. But sometimes you have other thing, which is a very nice gimmick. Let's say you have Shirat Ayam. Az Yashir Moshe Uvnes, that's nice, it's a beautiful song. But it's coming on Aliyat Revi. Now all of a sudden, everybody wants to buy Aliyat Revi. Why? Because the inter it's an interesting part. Or if it's Shema Israel, or if it's the Ten Commandments. So that's an interesting part in the Torah. It's worth more money. That's Kfirah. That's heresy. To say, that that part of the Torah is more valuable than that page on the Torah, that's heresy. That's why the Sfaradim do not stand in the middle of the Ten Commandments. Ashkenazim, when they come to the Ten Commandments, everyone rise. Sfaradim, on purpose, do not rise. Why? By rising, you're saying that the Ten Commandments are more important than all other pages in the Torah, which is heresy. Now, what happened to the Ashkenazim? They don't know that it's heresy. The holiest Ashkenazi in history was rising. They don't know. What's their excuse? They have a good excuse. You cannot deny that that part of the Torah was written separately on the boards. 
obviously it's more precious to Hashem, not to us. To us it's all equal. But to Hashem it's special. That's why he made the Ten Commandments and not Fifty Commandments. He chose that part to make them on the boards. We are standing for the honor of the boards. Not Chas V'Shalom, that we say, so what is Faradi is going to do if he comes to an Ashkenaz issue? Everyone stand and you see it. It's chutzpah. It's not good. It's also halacha, it's called lo titgodedu. Do not make groups among groups. Meaning everyone does one thing, and you and another two or three wants to be different than everyone. Everyone put talit, you don't want to pull. Everyone do not put talit, you already put talit. Everyone put filin in uh, Tisha B'Av in that synagogue in uh, Mimcha, you, you come on Shachrit, you put filin, nobody has put filin. Everyone there in Chol HaMoed don't put filin, you are a yeke. You sit in the middle with your tefillin. Come on, man, it's holiday. My tradition is to put filin in Chol HaMoed. So go to the lady section. <laughs> go on the side, there's a, there's a curtain there. Put filin over there, no one told you not to put filin. But at least hide. Why you want to be a pin in the neck, in the middle of everything? Do not be different than the others. That's a Jewish custom, not to attract attention. However, there is difference between Sfaradim and Ashkenazim. Because it's machlok and the Rambam and the Rosh. According to the Ashkenazim, if you do something different than the audience, you are, you are violating this halacha of lo titgodedu. That's the shitat Rosh. Ashkenazim follow the Rosh, was the chief Ashkenazi rabbi in the last thousand years. One of the three major poskim that we ever had, Shulchan Aruch. According to him, if you make a group among a group, meaning you act differently than the audience, you are breaking that halacha of Lot it go the The Rambam doesn't say it. The Rambam says Lot it go the means there is already bedding in the city, a few of them according to one tradition, and you want to come make a bad deal that will contradict the custom of the place. That's what it's got to do. So Sfaradi really doesn't have a problem behaving different than the audience. The Ashkenazim have a problem. However, a normal guy, you don't need to be Ashkenazi to understand that you don't want to attract attention, that everybody does one thing. Everyone stands and you sit. Everyone sits and you stand. So you have to follow the custom of the place. You don't want to find a place that follow your custom. So that's just to give us an idea. So, anyway, so you know, when the, one of the mitzvot of that we read in the parasha is that we have to bring the bikurim to Bet Hamikdash. In the old days, everyone was a farmer. Today, not even 1% of the Jewish people are farmers. There are many, many different professions. Most Jews are not farmers, but in the old days, everyone had a farm. You had chickens, you have sheep, you have cows, you have olive trees, you have tomatoes, you have wheat, barley, corn, whatever people grow. People use it for every day's life. They grow things in a, in a, in a, in a field. Pe hot peppers, Cucumbers, whatever people eat. It was a very, very common thing to do. As a result of that, now when you have fruit, when the season begins, the first fruit that comes out, immediately you put a special sign on it, Gemi. And you say, This is for Bet Amikdash. This is for the Kohen. When I go to Bet HaMikdash, I take the basket and I come and I give it to the coin. However, it's something very unique over here that you have to also give a speech. In front of everyone, you have to give a speech. You would come to the coin that would live in those days. And you would say to him, Today I'm coming to announce to your God what Rashi writes, you have to say this speech to prove that you are not ungrateful. That the first fruits that came and everyone desired them so much, you know what an excitement it is? That you finally see the fruits coming on your tree. Ah, look at this pomegranate. 
Ah, look at this. Unbelievable. Look at these dates. Amazing, huh? Dying to eat it. No, no, no. That's cost donation. First produce goes to Beta Migdash. But not only that, Rashi say you have to announce that you did what Hashem told you. And uh, not only that, you have to know one very interesting thing. You come to the land and you take the first fruits that grow from the ground. You put it in a tene, you put it in a basket, right? And you come to the Kohen and the Kohen will take the basket from your hand, right? And you begin to give your speech. And what is the speech of Abutai? What is the speech? Lo avarti mi mitzvotecha, I did not break your mitzvot, and I did not forget, meaning I'm not ungrateful. I'm not ungrateful. And what else? Please watch from up there in heaven and bless the nation of Israel and bless the ground and bless the land. Let's see that beautiful story about Akarat Atov, about gratefulness. One Jew inherited an apartment from his parents and decided to rent it out until his daughter will go up, and one day she's going to need it, so he's going to give her the apartment. Who is renting the apartment? A young Avrech that just got divorced. Got divorced. By the way, I, I just found out something very interesting in Israel now when I was there. I have a friend, he owns a building company. They build buildings. Big construction company. I say to him, I don't understand. Everywhere you drive in Israel, you see thousands of tall buildings, all brand new, that were built in the last year or two. Thousands, you cannot count, maybe tens of thousands. Everywhere in Israel, every city you drive, every place you go, every highway you drive, brand new buildings. I gave a lecture in Or Yehuda, and there was 20 buildings that were built by one contractor. 20 huge buildings in one street, one on the right, one on the left, one on the... Unbelievable project. And there's not enough apartments. The apartments goes up 18% every year. Did you ever hear such thing? This year it went up 18%, previous year 17%. It keeps going higher and higher. The rent goes higher, the, the prices of the apartment. One tiny apartment in Kfar Saba that is good for one individual. It's basically a room and a shower room. Not much, not even a studio. Do you know what's the price of it? In Kfar Saba, not in Herzliya or in Tel Aviv, Kfar Saba. 1.3 million shekels. A quarter of this room. <coughs> That's 60,000 shekel for one meter, one square meter. That means one square meter, it's nine feet, three by three. Imagine a square of three feet by three feet. That square, 60,000 shekel, it's almost $30,000 for a big, large cube. It's very expensive. It's like Beverly Hills price. So I asked my friend, what's going on over here? He said to me, there's a reason why there's not enough apartments. No matter how much you build, it's never going to be enough. That's why real estate in Israel will always go higher and higher and higher forever. 
I asked him, how come? He told me something I never thought about. So besides the population that grows every year, right? The Haredim have 10 kids, 12 kids, 16 kids. The Arabs the same. So there is a lot of kids that are getting married. They need another apartment. There is a massive pandemic in Israel, a pandemic of divorce. So every house that gets divorced needs immediately another apartment. So you need double the amount of the apartments because almost everybody gets divorced among the secular. So every house that is broken immediately split to two houses. That's why they make these tiny apartments for the men that he will have a room to sleep. The wife stay with the kids in the, that apartment and the man needs a bed. Because there's so much demand for that tiny apartment, they cost double per square feet than the big apartment. So you pay almost the same price for a tiny apartment, for a large apartment, almost the same price. Why? Because that's the, ma the limit on how much people can afford. So they're going to live in a shoebox. So this Avrech got divorced and he rented that apartment. And he couldn't go back to his parents' house, so he, he had to rent a place, but he, he had to continue to stay to learn in a college in Yeshiva. In the meantime, the daughter matured, and she cannot find the Shidduch. 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, she can't find the Shidduch. Days passing by, she's now how old? 25. 25. 25 by the secular people is still a baby. Ah, we're talking about marriage, you're out of your mind. Talk to me in five years. What's the rush? Have fun! <laughs> by religious people, 25? Oh, big deal of it, even though it's changing now. Because the world is changing. But let's say 20, 30 years ago, if you were 25 already, it has to be a problem. Today it doesn't have to be any problem. It could be a perfect girl, and sometimes she's overqualified. Not, no great guys for this girl. I see it all the time. Overqualified. So anyway, Rabotai, listen to this story. It's much incredible. So the day is passing by. She's now 25. One of the friends of her father came to ask him about what's their demand that their daughter is not getting married. Maybe they have very high demands. He said, I'm looking for her from, for someone very special. And I can't find. The, the friend say, I have a great offer for you. He's a guy, great Talmud Chacham. He finished the entire Shas. He has great middle. There's only one problem. He's divorced. But everything else about him is perfect. The father say, oh, come on. Divorced, my daughter, well, she's not divorced. Why are you suggesting for her someone that was divorced? There's nothing to talk about. A few days later, he heard some speech somewhere, you know, sometimes you hear a speech, it makes you all think again about something you already decided not to do. He said, how do I know? Maybe that's the shidduch of my daughter. I should check it out. <laughs> I should check it out. He comes back to his friend, who is that guy? There's a guy that rented an apartment. Who is it? The guy who lives in his apartment. His tenant. <laughs> Once he began to invest in it, until now he was collecting the rent and that's it. He didn't know that much about it. Once he started the investigation about him, they actually, he actually found out that he's a Jew. It's unbelievable. The girl actually agreed and now they're getting engaged. In the night of the wedding, the Chatan came to pay the rent. <laughs> night before the wedding. <laughs> to his future father-in-law. The father said, I'm sorry, you're not renting here anymore. You're not a tenant. You are the owner of this apartment. No more rent. Years went by, and the little girl, the younger girl, 
also mature. With her, immediately she found the shiduch, it was smooth, but the side of the girl, they insist that they must buy them an apartment. It's coming in Israel. Each side will give half of the apartment, and they buy an apartment. So the other side wants to pay half of the apartment if the parents of the girl will also give, but they don't have any more. They had one apartment, they gave it to the older girl. And he said, I'm sorry, I don't have enough money to buy another half an apartment. So he started to go from one gemach to another, borrowing here, trying there. He realized that no matter how much he collected, it's not enough even for 10% of what he has to get. So he had to give up on that shiduch. He had to say to the other side, I don't have the money that you're looking for. That day, knocking on the door, who comes in? His son, that Avlech, with a bag full of tens of thousands of dollars. He said to him, where did you get this money from? You're an Avlech in Yeshiva. He said, you took me to be your son-in-law, even though I was divorced, you gave me an apartment, you refused to accept rent. We decide, I decided that the rent that I had to give you every month, I'll put it on the side, knowing that one day you're going to need that money to marry that girl. So that's the money we saved for you over the years. Now imagine the father will be old-fashioned, close-minded, and wouldn't want to take that great guy just because he's divorced. He will come to Shamayim and they would show him what he missed. How much suffering is going to have for eternity in the next world? Especially if his daughter remains single. That could have happened. That's how she took. Nothing can do anything about it. I know families that mess the life of their children because the parents are full of ego. I know. They didn't want to accept any offer that was not according to their expectation and dreams, which some racism is also got involved in it. As a result of that, almost none of their kids got married. The kids pay the price. Haval. Sometimes it's different reasons. Sometimes the parents say, we're not going to marry the younger daughter before her older daughter will get married. They learn from a very, very righteous, important, huge Talmud Chacham. Yes. Lavan Arami. You know, you heard about him? Rabbi Lavan. Rabbi Lavan. Ben Betuel. Admor HaMekubal. Lavan. He has his own Hasidut. He's Lavan and everybody else over there is Shachor. You know, with their actions. Lavan said to Yaakov, well, I cannot marry the younger daughter's Rachel before we marry the older one. So he's stuck with the older one. <laughs> but that's not the deal. Who cares about the deal? Did you ever expect me to keep my word? You have too much you know, high expectation. You know. Anyway, Rabotai, that's one, one example of someone that has gratefulness, a karatatu. When you come and give the speech, when you bring the fruit, you have to say, Arami Oved Avi. He said in the Agadah of Pesach. Why does it have to do with the Bikuri? Why does it have to do? Okay, I brought you a basket with great fruit. Now I'm giving a speech. Arami Oved Avi. Who is Arami? That's Rabbi, Rabbi Lavan. The crook, the biggest crook, Lavan Arami, it's Naval Aramai. Same letters. Arami Oved Aviv Ayered Mitzrayma. Lavan caused the Jewish nation to go to Egypt. How? The Al-Shikh said, the Al-Shikh HaKadosh, 500 years ago, he said, the brothers were jealous with Yosef. That Yaakov made Yosef special outfit. Right? So, why, why they are jealous with Yosef? If Lavan did not switch between Rachel and Leah, Yosef would be the oldest son. 
the firstborn, from the main wife, from the first one, then everyone knows he deserved more than the others, and no, there will not be jealousy. Because he was the firstborn from the second wife, after already few sons were, were already born, the brothers could not take the shame that Yaakov preferred Yosef before them, when he's younger than them. That created hatred, and that's why they threw Yosef to the pit. And that's how he ended up in Egypt. And that's how the entire Jewish nation came to Egypt to be with him. And that's how the slavery started. And that's how we were almost gone spiritually completely. So whose fault is this? Lavan. So we have a verse in, in Bereshit 31, verse 55. Vayashov Lavan Limkomo. Lavan returned to his place after Hashem warned him, don't, don't dare to touch Yaakov. Once Yaakov, Lavan saw he could not kill Yaakov, what did he do? If, if you're running to kill your son-in-law, because your eyes is about on his wealth, your other sons instigate. Abba, look what he did to us. He cleaned us. He took all the sheep. How do you let such thing go happen? He stole the daughters like a thief. We're never going to see our own uh, sisters. What kind of a guy is this? We have to go find him. Okay, prepare your swords, prepare your horses, let's find him and kill him. No. On the way, boom, he get a smack. Hey, you fool, listen carefully. Don't dare to talk or to touch Yaakov, I'm warning you. After such a thing, when you see Hashem came to warn you specifically, if you had a little bit positive about you, not, you don't have to be such a big tzaddik, 5% decency, you would die from shame. Die from shame. Wow. I was about to do something that God hates so much that he had to come and warn me. What a shame. I would die out of shame if I would sit in a lecture of Rav Ovadia Yosef and he would tell me, sit and be quiet. I would not sleep for months. It happens to my uncle. <laughs> One night, 25 years ago, I come back from a lecture in Brooklyn in FDR Drive, 1.30 a.m. You know the, the area in FDR, there is always traffic close to the George Washington Bridge. So as I'm waiting in traffic, it used to be tapes, cassettes, cassettes. There was no CDs yet. You're already laughing at people that have CD players. It's already primitive. I'm talking to you when that's before CDs came out and we were shocked. What? This round thing have everything on it? Where is the tape? We were shocked when CDs came out. It was a revolution in the world. And if the CD has a scratch, <laughs> it gets stuck in one word for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> That's the generation we're talking about, only 25 years ago. So back then I had a tape. So I'm driving in my car, and I, I have a collection of Rabbi Vadya Yosef. All his lectures are recorded on the tape. I put one of them, enjoying the lecture, all of a sudden, what's the topic? Rav Ovadia Yosef is warning the religious people in Israel not to dare to vote to any secular party for the, for the election. You must vote for Shas. Haredim. If you're Ashkenazi, you know where to vote, to the Haredim. Faradi, you know where to vote. But for sure, vote for Haredim. Vote for the Torah. And don't dare to vote for those big secular parties. Why? Because the secular parties promote Chilulei Shabbat, promote non-kosher meat, promote all kinds of horrible laws, promote heresy, promote a lot of disaster. So anyone who votes for them is a criminal just like them. Why not what the same? You don't need to be genius to know that that's the truth. Then one person from the audience got up in front of 400 people there in Musayov, you know the place. 
excuse me, Kvoda Rabi Nibu. I said, this voice sounds familiar. <laughs> excuse me, Kvoda Rabi. What a guts he had. If you vote for a small religious party, anyway they join those large secular parties to form a government. Isn't it the same thing? That's after he's been speaking for, for half an hour to war, not to vote for the secular. The genius guy. <laughs> it's the first time I've seen Ravovadia is not just angry. You know what fuming means? Smoke. Smoke. If I was there, I can swear that smoke was coming out of his nostrils and his ears. He started to scream at him, Shem Shekhet Hatsuf, sit down, you arrogant. How do you dare to ask such a question? He said, sit down, be quiet, in front of everyone. I said, this guy sounds familiar. So, a few days later, I forgot. Then I go to Israel. I go to my aunt. She said, did you hear what happened? with my husband. I said, what? You didn't hear what happened with Rav Ovadia? I started to scream at him. I said, it was him. I know that I know the voice. <laughs> she said, poor man, two months he doesn't eat, he doesn't sound. I said, why? In the end of the lecture, Rav Ovadia told him that he forgave him. He said, in the end of the lecture, he said, and now let me answer the, the question of this chatzuf. <laughs> he answered the entire thing, that even when you join them, you still fight them within to prevent them from doing what they want to do. It's like you're joining a partner to protect him from not doing the wrong thing. But if you are outside, he will do whatever he wants. He doesn't care about you. So he explained the logic behind it. So in the end of the lecture, he got up again, said, Kod Arav, I'm asking for mechila, forgive me. He said, okay, I forgive you. Then he asked again, said, how many times you ask? I told you I forgave you. After all of that, that he told him a few times that he forgave him, for weeks, he couldn't eat, he couldn't sleep. So I'm saying, if a big chacham yelled at you like this, two months you don't sleep, you don't eat. Here is Hashem, come to this crook in Machshimo, Lavan Arami. What does he do in return? Continue to chase Yaakov. Finally, he called him. How did you dare to do such a thing to me? You're still my daughter. You didn't give me a chance to say goodbye to my grandchildren. And how did you dare to steal my God? Rafim, Rachel took his statue. How did you dare to steal my God? I don't understand you little fool. You just spoke to the real God. What are you running after a little statue now? First thing you should have said, thank you for taking my idol and put it in a toilet. Why do you care about this? You already found out who is God. Habits, bad habits, it's hard to change. Hard to change. So, Yaakov said, you suspect me that I steal your idol? That's how low you already came. If I touch your idol, anyone who touch your idol should die. That's how Rachel died. That's why Rachel died in age 36. When Binyamin was born, she died. The love of his life died. For seven years for her, didn't get to enjoy from her. Because of this idiot that followed him, even though Hashem warned him, he still went there. But let's hear the other part of the story that you don't read in a written Torah. You're not going to believe it. Moses Vayashov Lavan Limkomo, and he went back to where he came from. The Midrash, the Midrash say, after Lavan could not kill Yaakov, he did not, he wasn't quiet about it. He sent messengers to Esav, knowing Esav is waiting for years to kill Yaakov, that Yaakov is on his way. If you're looking for a chance to kill him, 
Now is your chance, and this is the direction he's heading to. And that's what got Asaph to hire 400 warriors and follow Yaakov in order for him to kill him. Chazal, our sages are saying that the advisor of Asaph told him, if you want to be smart, don't touch Yaakov. Don't kill him. Why? Because Abraham Avinu was told by Hashem that Hashem is giving him an inheritance. The inheritance is that his children would live in a land that does not belong to them. And they will torture his children and they will be slaves. And after that, they will come out of there with great wealth. If you're going to kill Yaakov, there will be only one grandson left, which is you, of Abraham. This prophecy must happen, that the children of Abraham must go to be slaves in a country that they don't belong, that they don't belong in. Do you want that to fall on your children? It's your interest that Yaakov should remain alive. Because you understand that Yaakov is the favorite of, Yitzha, of uh, Abraham and Yitzhak and the Rivka and all that. And he is the Torah learner and he is the special brother. So therefore he is the one that's going to go to Egypt. You should actually protect him, not kill him. What Esav did? Esav wrote a will to his grandson. Who was his grandson? Eliphaz. No. Eliphaz was his son. Who was his grandson? Amalek. Amalek. The dirtiest nation in the history of the world that Hashem hates the most came from Esav, from Eliphaz, from Amalek. He said to his grandson, Amalek, when the Jewish people come out of Egypt, not before, because if you kill them before the prophecy end, the curse will fall on me. I will have to go to Egypt. Make sure they finish the slavery, and when they come out of Egypt, you have to go and attack them. Now you got the answer how did Amalek find out that the Jewish people came out of Egypt and immediately he was waiting for them to attack them? First thing, when they came out of Egypt, Amalek is coming to attack. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Oh, that's the books. That's, uh, this box, don't leave before you take a book. It's uh, about Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, about the prayers in English. You don't want to miss the opportunity. So, anyway, Rabotai, so Rav Chaim Kanievsky has to say about this that the meaning of the Pasuk, Arami of Edavi, is Lavan, the wicked Lavan that wants to kill Yaakov, but he's not allowed because Hashem warned him. He's afraid to die himself. So what did he do? He used a sav to do the job for him. And why a sav did not kill Yaakov? For the reason I just explained. He preferred that Yaakov would go to Egypt. Now we have still one question to ask. Why does it say, oh, Arami Oved Avi? Oved means at the present, destroy. It should have been destroyed. Not destroy now. It's destroyed back then. What does it mean, Arami Oved Avi? When you come to bring Bikurim to Bet HaMikdash, that's 1,400 years after Esav died, after Lavan died. 1,400 years later, you say, Lavan, Arami, destroying my father. Destroying, no, destroyed, not destroying. Why you use the present language? The Khatam Sofer, the Chatan Sofer says, Bechol dor vador omdim alenu lechaloten. Every generation you have a bunch of goyim, such an empire, or even not, that have only one thing in their mind. They don't think about anything else. 
What's their goal? What's their dream? To destroy the Jews. Today it's Iran, before that it was Germany, or the Arabs. The Arabs is already for over a thousand years. Before them there were the Romans, and there were the Greeks, and the Persians, and the Babylonians, and the Philistines, and other nations, and Egypt. Every generation Hashem switching the color of his stick. The stick was blue, now it's black, then it became yellow, then it became red. But it's the same stick. I want to ask you a question. Someone hits you. He started with a blue stick, then dumped it and took a yellow one and hit you. Does it make a difference? It's a different stick. But who cares about the stick? You have to ask which hand is the one who hits me, not the stick. A dog, he thinks he has a business with the stick. If you throw the stick away, the dog is gonna bark at the, the, the stick for an hour in a park. You know, if you hit a dog with a stick, and then you throw the, the stick far away, the dog, he wants to murder the stick. You fall, the stick has nothing to do with you. This is your enemy. That's a person that doesn't have emunah which is basically everyone almost. Why did you do this to me? Why did you bounce the check? Why you don't pay rent on time? Why you didn't hire me? Why you didn't take me? Why you, you ruined it for me? Why you say this? Why, 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 why? In the end, all the people that are your enemies and you don't want to forgive him and you don't, you don't want to forgive her and you're angry about him and you're angry about that and you're angry about... In the end, it's all nonsense. Because really, in reality, it's, weak, it's you and Hashem and everything else is just the, the background. Nobody cares about the background. You are now one-on-one -on -one with your father. Your father smack you. One time he smack you with the right hand. Sometimes with the left hand. Sometimes he kick you with the right hand, leg. Sometimes he'll kick you with the left one. Sometimes he will take away something that you like very much. Sometimes you will hope he will give you something, but in the end he doesn't. And he has messengers. I want to ask you a question. If someone will come to you and say, I'm very sorry to inform you, but in Rosh Hashanah, Hashem sealed your verdict, and you have to die before Yom Kippur. But we are giving you one choice. How would you like to be murdered? By a white person or by a black person? Are you kidding me? That's what I have to think about now, white person. I'm going to die. Who cares if it's a white hand or a black hand? This is a bad joke. You're laughing, right? You are laughing. But we are like that. If you lost the money here or by here or by the, the ticket that you got, or by the towing, or by an accident, or by that guy that stole from you. In the end, the root of the problem is that Hashem thought that you deserve to lose $5,000. If that guy wouldn't rob you, it would be a dog that will cut your hands and you have to pay $5,000 for stitches. Or Chaz Shalom, a tree will fall on your car and it will be $5,000 damage. Hashem has millions of ways to give people what they deserve. But the people in their foolishness, instead of focusing on the hand that really hit them, all they are busy with, what color is the stick? That's not how you're going to be prepared for the judgment day. Why are you angry about him? You know what he did to me? What a shame, what an embarrassment. In Olam HaEmet, in the world of truth, your biggest enemies may become your best friends in eternity. Give you an example. Let's say, in front of 500 people, one person got up and started to insult you with horrible words. Murder you in front of hundreds of people. And it went viral. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people watch it. You cannot show your face in the street for you. You're dying. You lost 50 pounds. You can't eat. You can't function. You're dead. One day you die. 
You lived another 50 years after that big insult. Of course, after a year you forgot it, you mo moved on with your life, you got married, you became wealthy, you became successful, you have great children. You don't even remember that huge, horrible day. Now you come to Shamayim and you, say, and you see what happened that day when you were 40. And now you died in age 90. You live 50 more years. You have children and grandchildren and grand-grandchildren and lots of wealth and success and who knows what. Now you see that horrible day and your blood is fuming. I wish I could chop the head of this lousy criminal. And now you find out in your trial that this was a messenger from Hashem to insult you in front of thousands of people as a replacement to a horrible death that you deserved. You're supposed to die. And Hashem, because you gave a large amount of tzedakah, replaced your death by a big shame. Big shame. It's written, Amalbin pne chavero barabim keilu shofech damim. Someone insult another person in public, it's like murdering him. It comes red. The blood cells on the face are exploding. That's why he became red. Why? Why he became red? Because shame is and the pressure in the head is so bad that all the red tiny blood cells explode. And you see the blood under the skin. If there was no skin, blood would come out. That's why a person becomes red, especially if he's Ashkenazi. There's two options. Maybe his blood cells are bigger, or maybe the skin is lighter so you can see the red. If he's Temani, you don't see exactly if somebody buries him. It still looks dark. So the wider your skin it is, the more you see the pain. But the pain is the same pain. It doesn't matter. Black person, white person. The pain of the shame is beyond words. But there was a way of Hashem actually saving your life and giving you 50 more years of life and children and grandchildren and wealth. So actually that five minutes of insult that you had was the best thing that ever happened to you in your entire life. How much you want to thank that person right now? Can I go and give him a big hug? No, no, he's in hell. <laughs> Can I go there for one minute? You don't want to be there even for one second. You're not going there. No, no, just what? Gratitude, no? Judaism is all about, I wanna come give him a kiss on his head. Tell him thank you so much. Everything I have is thanks to him. Don't thank him too much. He was chosen for the insult because he was wicked. Not because he's righteous. Righteous people are used for good missions. Wicked people are used for bad missions. For execution, for murder, for stealing. Rabotai. Time is running out. One of the things we say in the speech, Lo avarti mi mitzvotecha velo shachach. I did not violate your mitzvot and I didn't forget. Rav Shapira, in his book, Mosne Tzedek, about the words of the Rama, the Rama lived 500 years ago. It says that if you see a person committing a sin unintentionally, by mistake, accidentally, accidentally, he forgot Shabbat, he walks, he got up from in the morning, oh, well, you know these people that takes them two hours to wake up? Son, we are in the middle of the evening. Oh, but you went to sleep at 8 p.m. last night. It's now 8 a.m., 12 hours. Why? Oh, Tell him there's a great basketball. Tell him Labon is coming to town. <laughs> what? I thought you tired. Anyway. So, if he wakes up in the morning and he's very tired, if he wakes up in the morning and he's very tired, what happened, Rabotai? 
if he wakes up in the morning, he's very tired. What happened to him? By mistake, he turned on the light. He turns on the light. Oh, Shabbat! Do you feel sorry for him? Do you have empathy for him? Are you upset at him? You're angry at him? What's going to be your feeling to someone who just spoke Shabbat? Because he forgot for a minute that it's Shabbat. What do you think? Huh? Would you feel sorry for him? Huh? Would you have mercy on him? Don't forget that even for something like this, he has to bring a sacrifice to Bet HaMikdash. Meaning if there was Bet HaMikdash, he would have to spend two weeks on the road with a donkey, going all the way to Jerusalem, climbing the mountains in a heat, go to the market, buy a, a sheep, go to Bet HaMikdash, climb all the way in the mountain in a heat with a 300 pound sheep, a real chubby one. I, I, and, the, and it keeps making noise. Man, <laughs> quiet already. What is group what I have to go through? Why? One second I forgot. Oh, that's the, that's the whole point. For not intentional breaking of Shabbat, they have to bring a sacrifice. For intentional, it's death by stoning and a permanent cut for the soul. Big difference between bringing a sacrifice, as much as it's a real burden and it's expensive, and you waste weeks of your life, and you have to see how they slaughter it and so much blood and the miserable goat, you know, and then they, they say to you, see, they should have been you. And you go with such a trauma home, believe me, most likely you will never forget about Shabbat anymore after that. That's the whole idea. So you feel bad for someone like that? Would you still be disappointed from him? Shame on you, look what you did, you criminal. <coughs> What's the right to Ashkafa? How do we have to look at someone like that? If he broke Shabbat not intentionally, is he a criminal or no? If someone is innocent, why you give him any punishment? Here he got a punishment. Serious one. He has to leave his business in Tiberia or in Sfat and go with the donkey all the way to Yerushalayim, which will take two weeks back and forth. A month on the road. Plus to buy a goat for $300, wait the whole day online, bring it to the Bet HaMikdash, sacrifice it, have a trauma, one month of your life for one second unintentional mistake. And Hashem is giving a serious punishment for breaking Shabbat not intentionally. How can it be? How can it be? The, the punishment has to be logical. We are not angels. How can we be? We go through such suffering, a month of hell, for one second mistake which we never had in mind to go against Hashem. Mercy. 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 Ah. It has to be deeper than what we understood until now. It has to be deeper. Why Hashem is so angry? It has to be a reason. Listen to this. Rav Shapira brings it on based on words of the Rama. Avera Beshogeg, as an unintentional sin, came to the person because be earlier he actually violated that sin purposely. If you were clean, you never violated that sin ever before intentionally, it will never happen to you not intentionally. The fact that he already did it once on purpose, with intention to do it, you, you lost your special protection. Listen to this. This is what he says when you come to the Kohen and bring the basket with the fruit. Lo avarti mi mitzvotecha. I did not violate your mitzvot bezadon, purposely. Velo shachachti, and I did not forget unintentionally. Lo avarti avera bezadon, I did not break your rules intentionally, and therefore it never happened to me that I forgot about it and did it not intentionally. Meaning, if I've done it intentionally, 
then for sure I would also do it not intentionally. Why? Mitzvah goreret mitzvah, and avera goreret avera. One sin pull another sin right after. The Gaon of Vilna, 250 years ago, one time he saw a peel of an orange on a table, and by mistake he touched it. By mistake, immediately he fainted. What's the problem of touching a peel of an orange? Mukse. Peels, usually when you peel them, they are mukse. Unless you can give them to animals to eat, or unless those peels deserve to be eaten by people. <coughs> Some peels have taste. If you wash them good, you can eat them. Today, with the pesticides, usually people don't like to eat the peels, but in the old days, it was all natural, all organic. So people used to eat the peels, but not orange peel, unless you're Persian. Then you cut it nicely and you put it in the oil, in the rice, and you have the best, most delicious rice in the whole world. They have a name for it, I forgot. There's good uh, rose water in it. And, huh? Tadik is the burned one. Still, my mash, it's unbelievable. It's delicious. It's good. It's so good that you eat it like dessert. Nice and sweet. The Persians have probably 50 different kinds of rice. So anyway, not to offend the Bukharians, you know, the Bukharians are, are fake Persians, you know. <laughs> Bukharian, Kafkazi, Afghani, they all came from Persia. Jews that spread to the suburb. <laughs> <laughs> but the original is the Farsi. Bukharian, once somebody told me that the, the king of Uzbekistan over there wanted people to need basket, and he paid very much, a lot of money. So a lot of Persians saw a great potential to go close to Iran, to Uzbekistan, and work over there. And once you were there, you were already influenced by Russians, Soviets, all the other ones. That's why the accent became different, but the language is still very similar. The food is also similar. But you have to know history. So, Rabotai, listen to this. The Gaon Mivinna touched the orange, the orange peel, and he fainted. His wife woke him up. <coughs> so what happened? He saw it again, fainted again. She woke him up again, he sees it again, he fainted again. His wife realized what's going on. When she woke him up again, she had the orange peel in her mouth already, eating it. I don't have to tell you how bitter it is. Before you cook it with the, with the sugar, it's not, not tasty. The question is why the Gaon Mivina has to faint if he touch Muktze not intentionally. That's not a sin. <laughs> Touching Muktze is a rabbinical violation. <laughs> if you did a rabbinical violation not intentionally, that's really no big deal. If you violated a rule from the Torah not intentionally, it is a big deal. But some decree by the rabbis which you never had intention to violate the words, accidentally you did it, you have to be more calm. What are you fainting like this? If you faint for touching an orange peel, what would happen if by mistake you lit fire or something on Shabbat? <laughs> or speak Lashonara, one word of Lashonara, you kill yourself. The answer is, Rabotai, now we know the secret. The answer is, because the Gaon Mivilna knew there is no such thing shokeg unless you did mezid first. There is no such thing unintentional sin unless you at least once before violated that sin purposely. Once you did it purposely, then you have lost your special protection. That means if you were very careful never to break that rule, even not intentionally, Hashem will save you from doing something not intentional. Not intentional. Based on that, we understand a big mystery that I always had. 
Now the Torah said that you have to make three shelter cities in Israel and three shelter cities across the Jordan River. Why? There are two and a half tribes that are living across the Jordan River, meaning out of Israel, even though it's still considered Israel in a way. But on the other side of the border, two and a half tribes, nine and a half tribes. How do you divide three and three? Should have been four and two, or five and one, right? But it can definitely should not be three and three. The Gemara said, because Mever Ayarden, there's a lot of murderers. Nafish Rotzchi. There's a lot of murderers. But hey, excuse me, we are not talking about intentional murder here. We are talking about an intentional accident that caused the death of someone. Do you know what it means, unintentional? You climb on a ladder, you want to go through the window, you forgot your key. So you borrow a ladder from the neighbor, you put it, you climb. Once you enter the window, the ladder fell or broke and fell on someone that walked by on his head and killed him. Did you have any intention to kill him? Do you even know him? No. The ladder broke. Why is it my fault? You have to go to 40 years in prison now. Shelter city. That's prison. You can be with your friends, family, this, that. You have to be with everyone around you. It's people that kill. Unintentionally, but kill. Obviously, it's not a pleasant thing that Hashem use you to execute someone that he wrote on Rosh Hashanah that should die this year. Why you used me? Why I am the executor? It's a big punishment, big insult, big shame. Plus, I'm getting a punishment? Now I have to be four years until the Kohen Gadol will die? Today, in America, if you drove on the street and one thief ran after he broke into a store, he ch the police chasing him, he ran, 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 broke into the road, a second before your car he, you know, was passing by and you hit him. And the police saw it. The police will arrest you? No. They will take away your license? No. They will tell you, you're good, you're clean, we saw everything what happened. You're not guilty. We're not arresting you. We're not taking your car. Call ambulance, take him to where he belongs. No one would think to give this uh, driver a punishment. But according to the Torah, he's going now to X amount of years in prison. We don't know how long. One year, five years, ten years, forty years, <coughs> seventy years. If the Kohen Gadol is young, if he's 40, 45, he may live to 110 now. He'll be over there for 60 years, 70 years. The question is not only I got punished for killing someone I didn't want to kill, or maybe it's my best friend, by the way. It could have been his son. It could have been his brother. It could have been his own father. It could have been a lot of people. The punishment is already that you were used to kill someone. Why you need another punishment? Where is the justice? The answer is, Rabotai, Chazal say in Gemara Masechet Makot, page 9, <coughs> that in the other side of the Jordan River, there's a lot of murderers. Then we ask right away. But we're not talking about intentional murderers. This is unintentional. Because in a Gilad, you know, over there, there were intentional murderers that also affected the whole place that other people would also murder unintentionally. Why? Because they didn't protest. They didn't make a big deal. They tolerate murderers, just like the world is today. Look at the fake hypocrite world how they promote and support the Hamas and the Jihad and Hezbollah and all these bloodthirsty murderers. Such filth, such horrible Nazis. So many thousands of those criminal murderers who have no mercy on babies. Slaughter babies in a crib. And the world has such empathy to them. And then if the Prime Minister of Israel comes to, to, to the United Nations, like today, 
They stand with signs, they call him war criminal, murderer. He doesn't kill an ant. And they call him a murderer. The ones who murder day and night for a living, that's all they do. By the way, they also kill each other. They only kill us, they say, oh, it's a political issue. But they kill each other for nothing. For nothing they shoot each other. For nothing. Right away, ta 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 ta. Every, everything by them is violence and guns. Right, but there's power, right, between Shuni and Shia. Yeah, yeah, it goes. Right. Shia, it's Sunnis and all this. The point is that I'm making is how the world can be such hypocrite. <coughs> so they have mercy on the murderers and they have zero mercy on the, on the victims. Nothing whatsoever. Even when a terrorist comes and shoot people and the police kill him, they get angry. And the police, the Israeli police, they get angry. Why you killed him? What exactly you wanted us to give him more ammunition that he should kill another 20 people? That's what the Gemara said. When you have mercy on a criminal, you are cool to the righteous. Last thing for today. After we read the Parashat Kitavo, 98 curses, the nation of Israel were fainting from fear. They just couldn't take it. Moshe saw they all became pale, and he said to them another speech. All of you are standing from the highest level to the lowest level. Meaning, yes, there's horrible punishments in the Torah. It's very strict hand of Hashem in everything. But after all, you see, after everything you did, you're still standing. Meaning, Hashem is not instantly punishing. He gives us X amount of time to repent. So there is a way that a person would commit millions of sins and will repent for them, and it's like nothing happened. <coughs> However, there are 36 exceptions to the rules. 36. 36 exception to the rule. Maybe there is Rambam over there, Chelek Aleph, Chelek Rambam, Chelek Aleph. I'm going to read to you about some of the exception to the rule. But before we're going to read it to you, what is unique about those 36 crimes? that each one of them, next to it, the Torah said that everyone who commit that crime will get a cut punishment. His soul will be cut from the life of eternity. When someone die, we write on his grave five letters. Taf, period. Nun, period. Tzadik, period. Bet, period. Hey, Taf, Nun, Tzadik, Bet, Hey. That's abbreviation of five words. Teh, Nishmato, Tzrura, Betzro, Hachaim. The soul of this deceased <coughs> person in this grave should be attached to the bunch of the living. Meaning, those who got life of eternity, and Shalamba, it has to be. Maybe over here, check over there, on that shelf. So, Te'e Nishmato Tzrura Betzrura Chaim. His soul should be attached to those who got life of eternity. There are people who did not get life of eternity. Who did not get life of eternity? You found? Yeah, he found one. Very good. I told you it cannot be. You know why? Because now, I'll tell you a story. Ramba, who lived almost 900 years ago, when he was alive, there were some rabbis are fighting him very much. Why? Because he was advanced. He was actually bringing quotes from Greek scholars, scientists, doctors, philosophers, the Rambam, his, goal, his direction in life was that the truth is above everything. The truth, regardless of who actually say that. 
לקבל את האמת מהאומרו. Accept the truth from any mouth to actually express the truth. Whether it's a Jew, whether it's not a Jew, whether it's a wicked Jew, righteous Jew, righteous Gentile, wicked Gentile, even from an animal. Sometimes Hashem show you the truth through an animal. Accept the truth regardless of who is the one who brings it to you. Why? Because if you decide to accept the truth only based on if you like the person or you hate the person and stuff like that, and that's the case, you are nothing but a politician. You understand? You're not a righteous person. The righteous person accept righteous person accept the truth from the person the, per, the person that actually said it. Now I want to tell you that when they started to burn the books of the Ramba, it was a very big thing. A student wrote him a letter. Unbelievable. A student told him, Kvod Arav, it breaks my heart to see what people are doing to you. He's a student speaking to his rabbi. The Rambam told him, I'm surprised at you that you are surprised. Where is your faith in Hashem? After the ego will be gone, pride of the people, meaning the politics and the ego and all of that will pass from the, by the time, meaning the people would pass from the world with their ego with them. I assure you that my books will be in every house of every Jewish person in the world. I want to remind you that when he actually said that to his student, there was no printing. Meaning to write one set of the Rambam will take you over here with a feather. You dip it in ink, and you write. Like you write Sefer Torah. You know how long it is. It's not like today you press a button and it prints 5,000 copies. In today's generation, if I say one day everyone will have my book, not very possible. With good publicity, printing is cheap. What's the big deal? Some millionaire will decide to make 5 million books and make sure that every Jewish family gets it. It's possible. It's not such a vision, but to write such a thing in a generation that it takes a year to write one set, how many years it will take to write the amount of sets that you need for every Jewish house to have his book? No, that's like a prophecy. So today, every place that respects itself cannot go a day without having the Rambam in that place. You're not going to find one yeshiva without it, one synagogue without it. That's when, when he told me he doesn't have it, he said, cannot be. It has to be here. Baruch Hashem, we found it. Just before we finish, the Rambam speaks about the concept of tshuva, of repentance. I want to read it to you. Midarke tshuva, the way of repentance, that the repenter, repenter, there's a word like that, person who makes repentance, how do you define it? Repenter? There's no such word. Make it, right? huh? Make it. But you know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. Yeah. Penitent? The repentant? The repentant? No, the penitent. The penitent? Yeah. yeah. Just penitent. The penitent. Okay, so the pen. We're learning English, English thanks to you. We have in the stadium, the penitent. That the penitent, the penitent, the one who makes repentance, right? He is screaming always in front of Hashem with tears and begging, crying and begging. Penitent. Yes. Penitent. I want to ask you a question. Uh, there was always a mystery to me. How a Hasidish Jew like you know English better than any American from the university? Believe me, you're the only one who always knew the words for everything. I'm sure there are people here who went to university. Top. Anyway, by the way, education, you don't need education. The Prime Minister of Israel didn't finish 12 years of school. And is now in the United Nations, meaning Arduan. 
one who didn't finish eight years in school. <laughs> the world becoming a, a bunch of, of, of uh, brilliant uh, genius uh, leaders. Anyway, so the Rambam writes that the penitent, pen, penitent? I'll learn that one day, don't worry. He's screaming and begging and crying. And one more thing. Give tons of charity. Without them, it's a complete, complete repentance. No ten tzedakah, or set tzedakah kefi kocho, according to his ability. He's a billionaire, he gives tens of millions. The millionaire, he gives hundreds of thousands. He's wealthy, he gives tens of thousands. He's average, he gives thousands. He's poor, he gives hundreds. According to his pocket. And he's staying away all the way from those things he committed sins. Whatever his weaknesses are, he runs away from them. He changed his name. What's your name? Peter. No, your name is not Peter. Your name is Pinchas. Oh, the last time I heard his name is my grandmother in my brief. <laughs> it's a shame that 40 years nobody called you by your Jewish name. Call you a name of some Russian Nazi Kozak, Alexei, Nikolai. What kind of names is this? Don't you have a Jewish name? Sometimes Jews come to me to bless them. I ask the name Goim. Names of Goim. Their parents never gave them a Jewish name. It's very, very sad. And one thing, you were in USSR, maybe you were afraid to expose your Judaism, I understand. But now you're 40 years in America. You didn't think to find a, a Jewish name to your kids? Sarah, Rachel, Miriam, Natasha. <laughs> I even met Jews that their name is Christine and Christina. Jews. There are Jews with their name is Christopher, Chris. I actually worked once in my days in business with a guy, Chris Cohen. <laughs> Even me, the moron I used to be, I, I said to myself, something doesn't end up with that name. <laughs> I ask him, you Jewish? He said, yes. I ask him, so how does the God this name, Chris Cohen? You got me? You should ask my parents. Today I know that his mother probably was a Goya. It's not Jewish. His last name is Cohen, but he's a Goy. No Jewish person will call his son Chris. Come on. No matter how secular you are. It's not realistic, unless the mother is a Goya, or, or one of the parents. Anyway, let's move on. The Rambam continued. Change his name. Literally or not literally. If his name is Christoph, He's going to make himself a kosher name. If you already had a Jewish name, Yitzhak, Yosef, Abraham, what, why does he have to change his name? Meaning, change the identity of your name. You used to be a criminal, you're no longer a criminal. I'm not the same person who used to act on those crimes. And he changed his way to a decent, straight way. And he's going to exile. Exile make many of the sins being erased. It's great repentance. Shegalut mechaperet avon. And yeah, and why? Because when you move from one place to another, you are becoming humble and down to earth. Now I want to ask you. Let's see who is brilliant here. What's the connection between exile? to becoming humble. Many Jews came to America, Israelis, without a penny in their pocket. They live now in Great Neck in a 30 million dollar homes, drive a Ferrari or Bentley. And uh, when you talk to them, they don't even answer you. Their nose is already above the, the moon with their ego. So what exa how exile exactly made them humble? It made them a lot more proud than what they used to be. When we talk about 
exile, we're not talking about moving from Be'er Sheva to Beverly Hills. That's not exile. Exile means that you're always on a run. Moving. You live here. They're chasing the Jews. They live here. They move here. They move there. They always run. They're always on a run. Now, when you're always on a run, every week or two or month, you're going to a different place. Nobody knows you. So if you already build yourself a reputation in your previous place, it's gone in a minute. You came to a new town, there's no Google, there's no news, nobody knows who you are. Even if you're a great rabbi, it will take you about a month or two until people get to know who you are. See, when the Rambam arrived to Egypt, he came to a mosque, he took a bottle of wine, he poured it in a glass, he made the bracha, Baruch Atah Adonai, Baruch Atah Adonai, Baruch Atah Adonai, Baruch Atah Adonai, he made a gift, and he wanted an excuse to drink. <laughs> so the Rambam held a glass of, a bottle of wine in front of a mask of a thousand Muslim Egyptians. What are the odds that a Jew would stand by a mask and scream that if a Muslim will touch the body, you have to spill it to the garbage? <laughs> it makes it impure. <laughs> what are the odds that someone like that would live another minute after that? Zero. Who would put his money on it that he will survive more than a minute? Zero. I wouldn't want to lose my money. <laughs> <coughs> Miraculously, <coughs> when the Muslim came and grabbed him, immediately they took him to the king for a trial. Who are you? You just came today and you make problems? Take him to the caliph. When he got to the king, they told the king that he was screaming by the mask and insulting the Muslims. The king asked him, who are you? He said, I'm a chacham of the Yehudi, of the Jews. I'm a big rabbi of the Jews. We don't have issues like this that rabbis come here to insult the Muslims here in Egypt. How do you just arrive here and you already make provocation? The Rambam told him, I assure you that I had no intention about a word of what I say. Actually, by the way, if a Muslim touched the wine, the wine does not become impure. If a Christian touch the wine, he's an idol worshiper, the wine is not is forbidden for use. A Buddhist is forbidden to be used. A Hindu is forbidden to be used. A reformed Jew, forbidden to be used. Conservative Jew, forbidden. Secular Jews, forbidden. Muslim murderer from the Hamas touch the wine is not forbidden. Because he's not an idol worshiper. He believes in God. He's a murderer. He's an animal. But he's not an idol worshiper. So the yain is not yain nesem. It's very interesting. So what the Rambam said anyway was not true. But it doesn't really matter that the Muslim wants to chop his head off. But now the king is going to make a trial. So he said to the king, I had two ways to meet you. The short way or the long way. The long way would take me 30 years until I get an appointment with you. The short way I scream something silly, immediately they bring me to you for a trial. And now I'm giving you an opportunity to ask me any question you want about anything and you can check my wisdom. I can be a great help for you and for your kingdom. I'm a doctor, I'm a mathematician, I'm an astronomer. I'm a philosopher, I'm a rabbi, I'm this. <laughs> the king started to talk to him. He realized he just won the lottery. He immediately nominated him to be his personal doctor. And that was his job. All day was taking care of Arabs. He writes himself, today I didn't have time to eat lunch. Because all day I was taking care of, of the Arabs. At one point I had to ask a remission to give me five minutes to eat. So how did he become the Rambam? Take 1,000 rabbis today combined, write one, 
put them on a scale and put the Rambam on the other side of the scale and it's greater than all of them combined. It's not, a, it's not an exaggeration. Everybody will admit that. How you became who you are from one day a week that he had time to learn, Shabbat. Shabbat, he didn't stop to learn from beginning to the end of Shabbat, he had the day off. The rest of the week he walked like a dog serving Arabs. See, he's riding. And he became one of the biggest legends in Jewish history. Why it exile makes you humble? Because until you finally established in a new place, you gotta move to a new place. So there is no ego involved. Nobody knows who you are anyway. You keep showing up to a new place. No, by the time you have, people will find out how great you are, you have to move again. The Rambam continue. It's a great praise to someone that repent to confess his crimes in public. Confess his sins between men to men, not between men to God. I, ans I, I offended Yitzchak. I insulted Yaakov. I didn't help um, Yosef. I apologized to all these people in public. And I regret it. Someone that has ego and is full of pride and does not express his sins is trying on the other hand to cover his sins. His repentance is incomplete. As there is the verse in the Torah, Mechaseh Peshaav Lo Yatsliach. Someone that tries to cover his crime will never succeed. Someone who confess and leave the sin will achieve mercy from Hashem. Someone who will try to hide his sins and pretend it's okay and it's good and he's, he have done, he have done nothing wrong, he will not succeed and his repentance will never be perfect. This is only things between men to men. Sins between men to God, he does not have to publish, because it's Chidul Hashem. So, he does it between him and Hashem when he davens. After Shemona he whisper, Shamnu, Bagadnu, all these words that we say. That's why we whisper and we don't scream that. Right? And... On that, it's written, Ashrei Nesui Pesha Kisui Chata'a. Someone that covers his sins, meaning sins between men to God, that's better than someone who runs around, I used to be this, and I used to be that, and I used to be poor, and I, what is this? This kind of sins is Chimul Hashem, you hide it, you don't brag about it, and you don't mention it. Even though repentance and screaming is always good, in the ten days between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur is greater than ever. Meaning from this Sunday night until following Tuesday, Yom Kippur. That's the days to repent. The highest level of repentance and the easiest way to repent. Meaning Hashem is very close. As it's written, Dirshu Hashem b'imatzo, kra'u b'yoto karov. Search for Hashem when He's around, meaning He's very close. Call him when he close to you. What are we talking here about? When the public together repent and scream with their hearts, Hashem accept their prayers. As it's written, who is like our God that when we scream to him, to him he always listens. Yom Kippur, the day of repentance, is the day of atonement is Yom Kippur. It's for the single and for the public. It's the opportunity to erase the sins. That's why everyone wants to repent and confess on Yom Kippurim. We find that all the davening is full of confessions and slichot. And of course, we fast and we suffer and we don't drink and there's no other pleasures. And therefore, <coughs> the entire day is dedicated for repentance. If a person has more sins than the regular text of the confession, he should add them with his own words, between him and Hashem when he prays. 
Yom Kippur does not erase sins between men to men. Only between men to God if he made full repentance. Sins between people to people must be forgiven to each other. You hurt someone, he has to forgive you. He doesn't forgive you, you have a big problem. You owe money to people, you must return. You don't have, you have to apologize for the delay and make a payment plan, give something, show interest to actually make things better. Otherwise, it's an incomplete repentance. But, as I say, there are 36 sins, 36 sins, that if the Torah mentioned that the soul will be cut, it's not enough to stop with the sin, it's not enough to confess, it's not enough to give a lot of tzedakah, it's not enough to shame and to regret what you've done. You must receive suffering, physical and mental suffering. There's no way to erase those sins from your file until you're going to suffer enough to erase them. 36 sins, like idol worshipping, eating chametz and Pesach, breaking Shabbat, eating Yom Kippur, sex crimes with the relatives, homosexuality, and stuff like that. Those are the worst crimes against God that exist in the world, with the highest and worst punishment you can imagine, in this world and in the next world. Therefore, it's not enough just to come and say, I became religious. Why exactly you religious? Look, I have a nice beer. Saddam Hussein also had a beer when they hung him, no? So the Indians who bow down to the cow, they also have a beer. How a beer exactly make you religious? It's not even an obligation. That's what makes you religious. Oh, I have a, a yamaka. Any, any Hamas terrorist has a yamaka. All the Sikhs in India, all these people, they have turbans. That was a very common thing. The Ben Shrey turban in Iraq, the people in India had the same turbans. So what? How, how exactly you became religious? I stopped with the sins. Oh, now you're talking. I'm ashamed. Beautiful. I regret. Beautiful. I confess three times a day, every day. Even better. The, better, the more you confess, the better it is, the Rambam say. And what else? I pass for you Yom Kippur and cry non-stop. Oh, great. So you erase almost all your sins, except 36. Those 36, after everything I mentioned, is still in your file. Until you get X amount of suffering. But I have a great idea for all of you. You can exchange the suffering with something you choose. Instead of getting cancer and chemo and other problems, give a lot of charity. Charity is blood. You work a month, you make, I don't know, $10,000 a month. You come and you give 3000 from that to charity in a month of Elul. That's 30% of the month. It's right there, 10 days of work. This is like sacrificing 10 days of your life to give to others, to people that learn Torah. So by this, you are actually showing Hashem that you love Torah. Or to save people to do kiruv, to save souls, to make them Shomrei Shabbat. So you want to save his children. You're not having a problem giving 10 days of your life or a month of your life for that cause that makes him so happy. Immediately, all those horrible suffering that are pending to come to you this year are crushed to pieces one by one. Another example, you, you, you pray every morning at 8 a.m. This month you pray at 6 a.m. Yeah, Minyan at 8, but there's another one at 6, 6, 15. Why do I have to get up at 5.30 if I can get up at 7.30? Why, why should I be tired all day? That's a part of suffering. When you suffer, that suffering on doing mitzvot comes instead of sicknesses and money losses and agony and pain and ugly divorce and your children torturing your heart from day and night. You can exchange the suffering that are waiting for you by choosing the suffering, meaning you learn a lot of Torah, you break your head in a Gemara, you give a lot of charity, you help people, you drive, you do chesed, you get insult and you don't answer, you work very hard on your midot, it's, a, it's, it's chopping yourself to pieces. 
people insult you, you want to kill them, you don't answer, you smile. Like David said, Hashem Amar Lo Kilel, Kalel. It's Hashem. If Hashem didn't want, he wouldn't curse me. So those 36 sins, Rabotai, everyone was Mechalel Shabbat, is in this category. A person should not be cruel, should be easy to forgive. Don't be cruel, don't take revenge. Forgive with all your heart. Even if the person tortured you a lot, a kosher Jew, if you want to check if you're really Jewish, you forgive easily and you have mercy on people who ask for forgiveness. If you see that you cannot forgive, and you're very hard, and you're stubborn, and you're cruel, and you will not rest until you take revenge against the person who hurt you, check if you are Jewish. You're probably not from the descendants of the Jewish nation, because the three signs of the Jews, the Jews have three stamps on them, every kosher Jew. Three stamps. One, merciful. Second, very kind, they like to be generous and kind and like to help. And third, they have shame. They embarrass to do things. They, they fear to do Chilul Hashem, to do horrible things in public. If you see a person that doesn't have those three things, most likely his grand-grandmother is not Jewish. Because someone that has a Jewish soul, Hashem say, the Jews have three unique things about them. They're all merciful. They're all generous, they like to give charity, and they have shame. Shame. They're embarrassed to do things. If you find someone who doesn't have them, or if they, who knows if he's even Jewish. Someone that hurt another person, and that person died, and he wants to apologize to him, but he's in a grave already. What's gonna be now? Person that you insulted very much, got a heart attack and died because of the agony you caused him. Now, a month later, you don't know how, how, how to forgive that, how to repent. You have to take 10 people to his grave and in front of them speak to his grave and tell him that you apologize for everything you did to him. The good news is that he must accept your apology <laughs> and he won't insult you and he won't call the police on you. So that would be an easy forgiveness. Besides the shame that you have in front of the 10 people that you have to reveal what you've done to that person, that's the only way to erase it. But why do you come to talk to a piece of marble? Because a part of the soul remains in a grave forever. So you're not talking to the marble. That's why people go to grave, and that's why people read the Elim the great. What for? You can read. Take him in the house. Why do I have to go to the grave? Your, your father's your side will go to the grave because the part of the soul is dead. Mamash, almost we done. Every person has merits and sins. Those who have more merits than sins, they are on the righteous side. Those who have more sins than uh, merit, merits, they are on the wicked side. Some people are half and half. They are called mediocre. Same thing by countries. They can have more sins and less merits, or the other way around, or half and half, mediocre. You know, same thing by cities, like you go to Tel Aviv. 50 years ago, they had a lot of righteous people there. Kabbalists, yeshivot, learning. The people were more modest. It wasn't full of gays and goyim. Tel Aviv was in, probably had much more merits than sins. Today, when you see what happened, it becomes the most wicked city in the world. Not in Israel, in the world. So there are so many horrible things over there. So the city is considered in Shamayim, Sodom. Wicked place. San Francisco, Sodom. New York, for instance. Not so sure that it's Sodom. New York is, is worse than Tel Aviv in some ways. Whatever they learn in Tel Aviv, they learn from here. But in New York, you have New York, New Jersey, you have maybe 100,000 people that sit and learn Torah from morning to night, which you don't have in Tel Aviv. Jerusalem have a lot of learners. Nebrak has a lot of learners. 
נתיבות, has a lot of learners, רכסים, has a lot of learners, צפת, has a lot of learners, חיפה, has almost no learners. Yeah, maybe few hundreds. I gave few speeches in Haifa and Yeshivot. But they are minor compared to the amount of wicked people over there. A lot of lefties, a lot of gays, a lot of anti-Semite goyim. Tel Aviv and Haifa are the two most wicked cities in Israel. Tel Aviv is the capital city of, this, of the gays, of the mentally sick people. And there's no other word for it. Don't try to make it look pretty. People that live against the law of nature, something in their mental state is not balanced. Regardless of religion, before we even go into the religion, the, the entire nature is designed with male and female, and they continue the race. That's the will of the Creator. Call him whatever you want. Call him God. Call him whatever you want. Call him the Creator. You know these people that it's very hard for them to say that it's God? I believe in a, in, in, a, in a divine intelligence. I believe that someone made the world. Call him God. No, no, I didn't say that. Don't put words in my mouth. The ego, the ego. The ungratefulness of these wicked people. It's so hard for them to say the word God. <clears throat> but before we even go to the book of God, before we're talking about the stoning and the death penalty to the gays and the permanent cut for their soul from the afterlife that it's written black and white in the Torah, before we even get to that, for an atheist, someone that doesn't believe in the Torah, but he see the world was created by someone, and he see that every species has male and female, and everyone goes against those laws, obviously rebel against the Creator, and already a criminal and jeopardize the world. Now when you go into the religion and you find out how much anger they bring to God and how many tragedies and disasters and natural disasters they bring to the world, they are the most criminal people in all history of the world. But today, they look at them they're like some kind of uh, pioneers. Wow! They're so advanced. What a false idiots. Men became a woman, women became a man. I don't know anymore. You get on the taxi, you're not sure if the driver is a man or a woman. The voice sounds like a woman. The haircut looks like a man. You're not sure. And now you go to the bathroom, you're not sure if everyone is your race there. In general, we must protest. If someone lives with that, then it's fine and doesn't have a problem with that. Not only that, you have to do people with a yamaka on their head such arrogance and such chutzpah that they hear about a gay marriage and they go to say Mazal Tov <laughs> with a yamaka on their head. Mazal Tov! Are ata mekudashli! The man said to the man, I sanctify you to be my husband and this idiot with the yamaka, mother orthodox from the university. Mazal Tov! There was a... F was a... What kind of a world do you live in? You know what kind of material people send me? It's a miracle you see me here alive and talking for what I've seen already, the field that I've seen in our nation. You know that there is a school, but it's the poor. Same thing over here. Not only that, there was a teacher who got a job in some yeshiva. And it comes as a woman, looks like a woman. And I don't want to say the name of that place, but I know it was all over, but I myself don't want to say it in front of the camera for only one reason. Someone told me that that place is on the way up spiritually. It used to be low. They made changes there in the world. They brought different rabbi. They tried to save the place. So a place that tried to repent and fix the reputation of the place and push it to the right track, we are not interested to criticize such a place. What happen, happened, happened. We want to encourage them to continue their improvement. We only want to criticize the criminals who not only do not repent, 
they go full force with their ego to do on purpose, and they only become walls. So, a person comes, and then they find out he's a man. Find out he's a man. But you know from this story, there's one thing I still don't get. You can fool a, you can fool a rabbi that interview a person, someone who is to be a man with all the hormones and the surgeries, looks like a woman. What does the rabbi know? What he checks exactly if it's a man or woman under the clothes? No. You see a woman, sounds like a woman, look like a woman, it's not a woman, it's a man. What can I do? Okay, that can happen to all of us. There's one thing in that video that I cannot digest. That that woman, man, has a husband with a black hat and a beard. Sitting on a bench together. How can you show your face? You are married to a man with a, with a beard and a yamak and, and a black hat. And you expose your face to the camera and smile. I know you're all in shock. Believe me, I was also in shock when I saw that. The person who sent it to me sends, you know, those emojis of vomiting. <laughs> Hundreds of them. That's exactly how I felt. I wonder if Eliyahu Navi will show up to announce the arrival of the Mashiach and will see this couple. I would pay any amount of money to see his face when he will find out there are such creature in the world. No. Obviously he knows the music. He right, he has a good point. He always is here. He sees the development of the world. Develop. Rabotai. Shh. Rabotai. Shh. Listen to this. Those are the people who lost their share to the world to come. You ready? Ay, ay, ay. They are cut and get destroyed and get judged for the size of their wickedness and their sins for eternity, the punishment will never end. You ready? Hold your chair very tight because some of these people in the list is every one of us. In case you are thinking that every one of you is Rabobadia or Rabbi Yashiv, maybe you should reconsider. You ready? Those who are who lost their share, they have no share to the world to come. אלא נחרטים ועובדים ונידונים על גודל רשעותם וחטאם וחטאתם לעולם ולעולמי עולמים. שם ירחם. If you understood now the sentence that I just said, you would have to faint on the floor now. From this sentence alone. המינים! People that are heretics, infidels. Apikorsim, different kind of infidels. Kofrim b'Torah, deny the validity of the Torah. Kofrim b'Tchiyat Ametim, don't believe in the resurrection of the dead. Ah, you believe the dead people will come out of the grave? It's written in the Torah, it's written by the prophets. There's a verse that Hashem will open the grave. I will open your graves and get you out of there and put your spirit back into the body. There is a verse in the book of God. Ah, I went to university. I have a master degree. You, be, you expect me to believe a person that is a thousand years in grave will come back to life? How do you believe that from a drop of liquid here? Ah, look at this. Oh, a drop of liquid. Sleepy Joe was created. <laughs> from this drop. President of the United States. Ah? What's harder, to create a human being from that drop, or to create a human being from a skeleton that is 50% designed already? Just you need the ligaments, the muscles, the nerve system to attach, but you already have an image. You have the holes of the eyes, just fill it up with eyes. What's harder, to create a human being from a drop of liquid, 
or to create a human being from an existing skeleton. Ah, but skeleton we never seen, so we can't accept it. Yes. And, uh, and a drop of liquid we see it every day. Millions of people born like this every year from a drop, so it's, it's nature. It's, what's the difference between nature and miracle? There's no difference. It's just the frequency. That nature happens all the time, and, fr and miracles happen once in a while. They're not as common. That's why we are so impressed by it. But for Hashem, it's the same exact transaction. To create rain, or to revive the dead. It's the same thing. The Gemara said that the day of the rain is like the resurrection of the dead. It's equally difficult <coughs> to, to create rain and to revive dead. It's the same thing for Hashem. Either way, he doesn't have to sweat extra. Oh, today I have a hard day on my schedule. What do you have, dear God? Today I have to focus. I, have to, can, I can't make a mistake. Why? Why? I have to revive a billion people, a hundred million people, bring them back, creates their image. That's heresy. Hashem needs us. Why did you create me? I didn't ask to come to the world. The mount of the most biggest criminal and heretic on earth. And there to write a book like this, as a Gehenom is waiting for him. In a trillion years, the Gehenom will not end. Twisting the minds of thousands of fools and naive people that don't know Aleph Bet of Torah. Ah, he's right. Hashem does need us. Hashem is scared. He was lonely and depressed. There was no one to give him Prozac. So he created people that he should look at them to entertain him. That's what it sounds like. Who would ever believe that we live in a time that someone will write such nonsense, such heresy? And the biggest problem is that there is an audience for that. One thing, a person lost his mind. His ego got him to lose his mind. But how is it possible that there is, a, there is an idiot that paid money to buy that book? What kind of a punishment they will get everyone who bought this book? They don't know what they did to themselves. You know what it means, Avodah Zarah? If they only knew what it means to modify the Torah, and publish the Torah differently than the way Hashem designed it. What kind of a crime it is. These people would never, ever stop crying. If it will help them or not, I doubt it very much. So, who else? Someone who denies the arrival of the Messiah. I don't believe in a Savior. People who gave up Judaism. What are you? I became Christian. Jews for JC. I'm Muslim. I'm a Hindu. I'm a Buddhist. I belong to a cult. What's the cult? We have a basket that you clean the macaroni with that. You put it on the head. Did you hear about yeah. this group? Yeah. <laughs> they put a basket on the head. So when they come to take a picture in the driver's license, you know, in a motor vehicle, they refuse to take the basket off. It's against their religion. You have a macaroni basket. You know those plastic macaroni? Strainer. What? Strainer. Mm -hmm. Strainer. For whatever reason, they decided that that's the, 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 the flag of their religion. They put it. I don't understand what's happening here. No. It's against my belief to take it off. So, so in the Bible, lines with the policeman open it up. <laughs> What's this on your head? So, anyway, he doesn't believe in Mashiach. He left his religion and then defined himself as someone else. Persuading the public to commit sins, convincing them like this guy with a book teaching them and modify the Torah and teaching them nonsense. Do not participate with the Jewish public when they have ceremonies and holidays. He doesn't want anything to do with them. He's on his own. Someone who commits sins 
in public with no shame, עושה עבירות ביד רמה בפרהסיה, such as מחללי שבת, driving a car on the street, walking in the street with cigarette, with a phone, TV in his house, blasting, or goes to a non-kosher restaurant in Manhattan, sit by the sidewalk and eating brief. People see him, there's no, there's no shame, walking in the street without yamaka. Walking, uh, you know, doesn't put filin, doesn't come to shoe, doesn't fast on Yom Kippur. עושים עבירות ביד רמה בפרהסיה. המוסרים, someone who turned Jews into the authorities, IRS, I have a big fish for you. Who? My ex-boss. I tell you exactly where he has his money. No, as I say, why he's doing it? Because the boss didn't pay him his commission. And usually, it ends dead. That's why he quit. Oh, you owe me $3,000. If you don't pay me by tomorrow, I will turn you into the FBI. Just the fact that he turned him into the FBI, as guilty as he was, he lost his share to the world to come. Think about it. Person was religious 60 years, went to yeshiva for 10 years, went thousands of times to synagogue, fasted hundreds of times on Yom Kippur, tens of times. <coughs> Did so many things, gave tzedakah, really lived the life of success spiritually. In a moment of anger, called the authority and turned a Jew into their hands. They went and arrested him and whatever the case was, either they put him in jail or they took away his money. And again, we are talking about someone that is guilty. Someone that is guilty. Someone that is not guilty, it only makes it ten times worse. <coughs> Even a guilty person. That's called Moser. Someone like that, you're not allowed to say hi to him on the street. You're not allowed to stand in the same room with him. You're not allowed to marry his children. You're not allowed to let him enter the synagogue. You're not allowed to do anything with him. No business with him, nothing. He's completely isolated. No one is allowed to say hi to him. If he talks to you, you're not allowed to answer him. That's called Moser, a traitor. How many of those lefties we have in Israel that, like this, they go to the world, to the anti-Semite European, BDS, and make complaints against Israel, helping the Arabs to destroy us? Million traders like this. The Turekarta, another bunch of fools, who goes to Iranians and, yes, they, they read the Ilim by the grave of the mass murderer Arafat, the rat. Who would ever believe such thing? What a world it became. It's hard to believe. What else? Who else? Taking control on the public, not for the sake of heaven. Not because you want to make them righteous, not to make them religious. The other way around. He wants to control their money, wants to make them their, his servants, all kinds of things like this. Murderers, shofchei dami, people that spreads Lashon Hara, gossip. Someone who was moshechet orlato. In the old days, people that were circumcised, they remember that the, the showers were a public hammam. You know what's public hammam? You didn't have uh, showers, you press a button and water comes out. They had pools, public baths, like Turkish baths, and similar style. So Jews and non-Jews used to come to take a bath there. So right the way you saw who's a Jew and who's not a Jew. Circumcised people are Jewish. That's before the Goim started to circumcise their kids. I'm talking hundreds of years ago. Some Jews wanted to hide their identity, so they used to pull the Ola until after a while it looks like they were not circumcised. It's not coming that someone will do such thing, but in the old days, because everybody saw everyone without clothes, people were very embarrassed. What they want to do? I'm not going to take a shower. Every time I go to the shower, they are going there. Some of these go even to semi. It was a very, very hard test. Some of them are wait, waiting for, for the opportunity to murder you or to rob you. So they wanted not to show their Jewish identity. Like in some countries, Jews go without yarmulke. Very dangerous. You're going to walk with Jewish identity. Someone will stab you in the back. 
it's a very common place of danger. But people who does it, meaning they embarrass of their Jewish identity, they lose their share to the world to come. What does he mean, meaning someone that says there's no God? I don't believe in God. The world doesn't have a creator. The world was created by, a, by an explosion. Someone that, or someone that said there is a leader to the world, a creator, but it's more than one. There's a bunch of gods, like the Greeks, the god of this, the god of that. Or someone that said there is one god, but he has a body, like a person, and an image. He has a beard, he has blue eyes, he has brown eyes, his hair is like this, you know, things like that. Or, there is a God, but it's not the first one. He wasn't here first. There was things before him. Or, someone that worships someone else but God. He worships JC, or the Christians. Or, he worships his Rebbe. One of the youngest idiots that worship the Rabbi and made him a God. He's the real God in their mind. If you connect them to a lie detector, who occupy their mind all day? God or the Rebbe? As holy as the Rebbe was, it's not God. But in their mind, he is my God. They are also like this. People that lose their shirt to the world to come. God forbid. Remember, this we are talking about fully religious people here. People that learn Gemara, people that come to Shul, people that put fill in. But they believe that their Rebbe is God. He runs the world, or things like that. Who is Apikorsim? Someone that say, I don't believe in prophecy. All these prophets, they made it up. I don't believe it. Or I don't believe that there is information that come to the people's heart from God. Or I don't believe in the prophecy of Moshe Rabbeinu. Or that God doesn't know the actions of the people. This is considered a picosi. Who is kofrim ba Torah, denying the Torah, someone that said the Torah is not from God. Even one verse, even one word, even one letter, Moshe made it up. It's not all of it from God. Or Moshe wrote the whole Torah based on his own idea. That's called kofir ba Torah. Or someone who denies the explanation of the Torah, meaning the oral Torah, what we call Mishnah and Gemara. Ah, the Chachamim made it up. That's very common among some people with Yamakas on their head. Usually it's common by people who spent few years in university. Some of them are starring in my blacklist. Sixteen of them in my blacklist. They're all people who used to learn Torah and then went to university and the university corrupted their mind to a horrible monster level that from religious people at one point they became the biggest enemies of Hashem teaching nonsense, teaching heresy, destroying the mind, allowing what Hashem hates the most not allowing what Hashem wants very much bottom line they destroyed everything in Judaism, destroyed and they are still on YouTube. And they still have fans. That's a holocaust. Spiritual holocaust. Those criminals are still alive and kicking and still people come to listen to their nonsense and share their videos. Every time you share a video of one of these infidels, you become one of these people that have no share to the world to come. It's no joke. You're promoting things against Hashem. What, what are you playing with fire? Or someone that say that, you know, you have to worship a middleman between God to us. Who are you to connect directly to Hashem? You must connect to Rabbi such and such to connect you to Hashem. That's a common thing about some people. Who do you think you are? You think you connect to Hashem with your tshuva? You have to connect to that rabbi, and he's the only one who can connect you. That's pure Avodah Zara. What else? Uh, someone that says that the Creator replaced this mitzvah for a different one, and this mitzvah is not valid anymore. 
Meaning he took one of the 613 commandments and he said this commandment is not, not anymore in effect. That's also Kufir Batura. Like Christians, you don't have to do this anymore, you don't have to do that anymore. And other cults. Who are Meshumadim? Someone that is Meshumad to one thing is Meshumad to everything. Someone that actually commit a sin in public, people are warning him, people are threatening him, people are begging him, he is refusing to stop. Why? He wants to do it, even if it's not such a big sin. For instance, he's wearing clothes that have sharpness, wool and linen, or he cuts his sideburns above the bone. That's very common among modern Orthodox people. I see them, they have long pairs. Many people that have beard, they have pills. People that don't have beard, at least they leave sideburns. How long the sideburns has to be? First of all, they have to be long enough that you can catch the hair and fold it. If they're very, very short, like shaving, and there's nothing to catch, you're breaking every time you shave, you're breaking the rules of the Torah. And it has to be below the side bones, meaning the bone is about one centimeter long, half an inch almost. It starts here and it finishes one centimeter lower. Some people, the air will reach the bone, but doesn't go over the bone. It has to go all the way to the end of the bone. Sometimes you go to these Goish Italian barbers or Arabs, and they have this razor, and they come to the side and cut it, or even with the machine. They cut it too high, and you walk like this. It's Chilul Hashem. You have to leave side bells. So, People tell him once, twice, you're not allowed to shave like this, you're not allowed or to shave with a razor. You're not allowed to shave like this. And he doesn't care. No, no, it's hard for me to buy a machine. It's hard for me, I'm not used to it. That's called Meshumad. Mumar le Damar Echad, Mumar la Torah Kula. Sometimes he does it on purpose to get people angry. On purpose he eats this kind of meat. I tell him it's questionable, it's not, it's not kosher. No, don't tell me. That's what I'm going to eat. This kind of people. And Machtiya Rabin. People that spread nonsense in public and commit other people to commit sins. Like JC. JC. Christian JC. Rabban brings him here. What did he do? Collected people from the street and became their guru. Someone does not participate in a tzibur. When they fast, he doesn't fast. When they cry, he doesn't cry. When the skichot, he doesn't go. We got the point. Who are Muslim? Someone who turn his friend to the end of the goyim to kill him, or to only beat him up, not to kill him, or to turn his property and money to the end of the goyim, to the end of a robber, to the end of a rapist, People like this lost their share to the world to come. People that rule the public very strictly, that they all shake from them and they're afraid of them like kings, but they do it for their own honor and money, not for the sake of God. Every one of these 24 people, God forbid, hopefully we're not, none of us is in this list. I don't wish any Jew to be in this list. But unfortunately, many are in this list. Lost their share to the world to come. But the good news is as long as we are alive, we can fix everything. Even these people in the black list, no matter how horrible is the damage they made until now, which is beyond words, if they will stand one day and repent and retire and stop giving their nonsense, heresy speech, and this guy will ask everyone to burn his book. That would be a great repentance. Why? Because at least the person show regret. I'm ashamed for what I've done. Now he's in the end of Hashem. Hashem will decide if he wants to accept his apology and repentance or not. That's why I don't want to mention the name of that yeshiva after I heard that they're trying to fix the place and make it very orthodox and kosher. The last thing I want is to discourage them. The opposite. 
Someone who finally got on the right direction, you gotta give them every support and push that you can. From that moment on, Hashem looks at that person differently. Like the Rambam said, yesterday was despicable, hated, pushed away, abomination, and today is loved and welcome and a friend. Everything turned around 180 degrees. Why? Because he entered the path towards Hashem. He didn't get there yet. Rabbeinu Yonah say, mit yatsev al darkei atshuva. He entered the right highway to the right direction. The last sentence for today. We have two people. One person is driving on the highway to the opposite direction from his destination. He has to go to end of Long Island, to the Hamptons. And from Great Neck, he's driving towards Manhattan instead of going east. After half an hour, when he arrived to Long Island City already there, he begins to see the buildings of Manhattan. He realized that he is now on the wrong direction. So he's going off the exit of Van Damme and make a U-turn on the LIE, and now he's facing east. Another person just left Great Neck with the same mistake, driving towards Manhattan, only one or two exits. He didn't even arrive to Queens yet. He's in Little Neck over there. But he doesn't know that he's driving to the opposite direction. So every minute is on the way to the opposite direction from the right destination. But he is closer to the destination as of now. The other person that is almost by Manhattan who turned around is about 10 miles further away from the destination. Whose situation is worse right now? The one that is 50 miles from the Hamptons or the one that is 60 miles from the Hamptons? Whose situation is better? Who is better, the 60 or the, or the 50? The 60. The 60. Because he's, now he's going to change. Logically, many people would say or claim that that person in Little Neck is closer to the destination. Logically, you can say that. But the truth is, according to God and the Torah, and that's what Rabbi Yonah say, the person who made the U-turn and is heading now towards the right destination is in a much better situation than the one who just started his journey on the way down. Why? Because he's now already building his future. He already repents. He started a move, a move of repentance. The other person is growing his crime by the minute and going further away from the destination. The destination is God, if you didn't get the point. So who is in a much better situation? Rabbi Yonah say, someone that already <coughs> entered the right path. And that's, let's hope that all of us is in this situation. We are far away from the destination, but at least we already aimed it. We have some setbacks, we have some flat tires, we sometimes get off the wrong exit by mistake and go back to the highway. But overall, we know where we had to go. So we are in a much better situation than someone who has no idea. It's not a shame. This will help us to complete our tshuva. I spoke yesterday about my tree for an hour and a half. So my trip, Baruch Hashem, every one of the trips is successful. If you saw the videos on my groups of all the Baalei Tshuva who comes to the stage and puts it in and becomes Shomre Shabbat. Just today I was informed that four guys from our seminar went to Yeshiva and they learned four days. I send it to you. So Baruch Hashem, like I said, we make thousands of Baalei Tshuva every year. Multiply it by 27 years, you do the math. My estimate is more than 200,000 Baalei Tshuva, maybe 300,000. We don't know all of them from what we know. One, when we come to Shaman, we will know how many. But one thing we do know is that every day 
There are more people who got closer to Hashem thanks to our activity. When I say our activity, I'm not a one-man operation. Without the supporters, without the donations, without Benji, without David, without all the people who volunteer and help. All over the world I have people like this. When I go to Europe, I have people. When I have in Israel, I have people. So all the people who participate, some more, some less, some support big time, some support not so much, Together, it's a one operation. People ask me, how do I know how much for my money, how many ballet shoes I made? Maybe I gave a $1,000 and my friend gave a $1,000. Maybe his thousand made 10 ballet shoes and mine only made one. Good question, right? Yeah. First of all, it's not in my hand. It's in the hand of Hashem. You understand, right? Which USB will go to what guy, your money or his money? That's only Hashem maneuver. But there is a good news. Even though Hashem in the end decide what dollar goes to where and to whom, overall you own a stock in a company that is growing and doing a lot of wonderful things. That means in general, you have a share in everything good that happens. The yeshiva in Yerushalayim, the yeshiva in Monsi, all the ballet shuva, all the people who became rabbis and opened their own yeshivot. I have many of those already. They teach. The two experts that makes the best feeling in the world. I, made, I took both of them from the street, made a ballet show, and now they became top in the world for making batek feel. Top in the world. One of them comes to Lakewood to give speeches to the big rabbanim over there about batek feel. I, I just said yesterday that I bought five very special batek feel, 100% handmade, without electric without machine, without rotors, you know, the machine cuts 90% of the time. You have to do it with your hands, with the pedals. You know how long it takes to make, but that's how much the Rabbeinu made Philin. He didn't have electric. There are different levels in Philin. There's one level that you hold the hand on the button and the machine does the job, but you still have to hold the button. If you leave the button, it stops. Some people have bigger shortcut. They press the button and leave, and the machine does the job. That's not so good. If you hold the machine, that's better because it's still your hand, but you're not really touching that feeling. The machine does. As the highest level is that you, when you do everything with your hand, it takes a lot longer, but it comes to be 100% handmade, a piece of art. Something like this would cost fortune here in America. So I get some of those because the guys, my bar tshuva, is doing me a favor every few months. I get five pairs. Yesterday I announced about the five. Before I finished the lecture, four were sold. Why? People smart. Even one guy told me my son is a bar mitzvah in one year. But I won one of them. But when we started to talk, I found that his son is a lefty. He needs a different kind of feeling. So he couldn't take it. If the one of them was lefty, it was also sold. Why? Because people understand it's unique opportunity. And the sofer is someone that was recommended by Rav Ovadia Yosef. The, the stripes are 100% handmade, big, highest quality. Bottom line, you know how they make all stories with the hand? And you pay three times more than another luxury car because it's handmade? It's similar. The idea is similar. It takes a lot longer to make. It's all checked one by one manually. It's not commercial production like in other factories. They make a thousand, thousand, ten thousand a year. They only check one out of 50. They don't check each one. They check and they take few samples and they check. It's okay. They assume everything else is okay. I bring them for a little bit less than $2,000. If you would be in a store, you know that a regular pair here in a store already costs three, four, five thousand dollars 600 now. 600 No, but I'm saying just that you know that in a store, very average filling today already costs close to $3,000. Nothing special. And if you want something special, especially if you're Ashkenazi, they pay five, 6000 And it doesn't come even near this pair. Because even what they consider very high level, it's not 100% handmade. They use electric. So this is just to give you an idea. But who would ever believe that I got this guy to come to our Yeshiva in Monsi 23 years ago? 
And I found out two years ago that he's number one in making pate chilin in the world. He makes them 100% of the What's the name? <laughs> I'm Moshe Miskil, I think. And there's another one that I that came from Japan. Listen carefully. He came from Japan. Remember, I used to give shiurim by Dina Moshe. He had green hair, orange hair, blonde hair, three different colors. I come to give a lecture where I where I spoke for years. I made over a thousand lectures in that house, the Israeli house in Queens. Almost all my Hebrew lectures, you see where I sit. I come over there, I see on the couch an Israeli guy, 21 years old. Hi, what's your name, blah, blah, blah. Where you came from? Japan. What are you doing here? I have nowhere to go, so they told me I can sleep here. Come, I'll take you to Monsi. <laughs> After he had the lecture that night, I'm coming with you to Monsi. I told him, what even yeshiva? Became world expert in Batet Filin. He comes to Lakewood, the big yeshiva, to all the Rabbanim and teach them about feeling. He became his job all day. He has mamashim. So you see, I don't know what Sashem calculation to Baalei Tshuva, one is 25 years, one is 23 years. They became Rabbanim. They're very big time the Chachamim. They learn many years. No, they don't write. Right is, di- right is different, Sofri. Writing is different. Yeah, it's different. But uh, I'm talking about the batik. By the way, I hope you heard about the news that they found five red cows, yeah. and one guy from Texas donated the five red cows, and they moved them to Israel. Wow. And they say the rabbi that checked them that they all kosher. Really? Wow. It leads us to believe that we're very close to Mashiach. By the time Mashiach comes, at least one of them will have to be kosher. Not all five. We need one out of the five. Oh. Now we have five, four on standby. <laughs> Benji, like the, like the batteries here. <laughs> we always have standby because the lectures are too long. So we need to have few batteries on reserve. And a memory card. And that few before, yes. Bezrat Hashem, I want to wish every one of you Shana Tova, Kdivayim Khatima Tova. We will meet after support. What's the time of what? Tomorrow I speak in Great Neck. Tomorrow at 8.30 with Rav Yaakov Rahimi. And in Motze Shabbos I speak in Or Natan at 11 p.m. followed by Slichot in Queens. Queens Boulevard. You have the address on the website. That's going to be a special event. It's one night before Rosh Hashanah. Baruch Adonai Le'olam. Amen.